afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the 2020 New Legislators Virtual Retreat. I'm Zach Williams, staff writer at City and State. I want to say congrats to all the new lawmakers who won election this year to the State Assembly and Senate. Obviously not a very easy thing to do, especially with the pandemic raging across the state. We got a great set of panels today that are going to give you and the rest of our audience a great crash course in how things get done in the Capitol, from the state budget process to keeping people engaged on the biggest issues facing the state. But before I introduce our first panel, I want to give a big shout out to our great sponsors, Ostroff Associates, Brown and Weinrob, and Long Point Advisors, who really did a lot to, to uh, help us make this event happen here today. I'll uh, give them a good round of applause in lieu of general uh, clapping. Uh, and now, without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague, Annie McDonough, who's going to kick things off with a discussion about navigating the state budget in the year ahead. Thanks very much, Zach, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm Annie McDonough. I'm City and State's tech and policy reporter. I'm very excited to moderate this panel on navigating the budget. Uh, I know it seems a little hard to believe that budget season is going to be upon us very soon, uh, but I think that's all the more reason to start talking about it now, both in terms of what new legislators should know going in and what we all might want to know about how uh, things might change this year because of the pandemic. We have three panelists here to guide you through it, all representing different perspectives in the process, and I'll ask them to each introduce themselves uh, in a moment. But first, just a programming note, we'll leave some time at the end for questions from you. So as we go along, please feel free to post any questions you have through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll be monitoring that box throughout uh, to pose those questions to our panel as time allows. Um, so before we get into the nitty gritty, I'll just ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, then we'll get into it. Uh, Patrick, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, thanks, Annie. Um, my name is Patrick Orecki. I'm a senior research associate at the Citizens Budget Commission, uh, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit um, uh, think tank or civic research organization focusing on New York City and New York State uh, fiscal matters. Thanks. Scott, I'll also jump in. Sure, I'm Scott Wexler. I'm a managing director here at Ostroff Associates. We're an Albany based government relations firm. And as lobbyists, our role is to help guide our clients through the budget process, give them the benefit of our experiences, um, and to be a resource to legislators and other policymakers. So hopefully we'll be able to share that uh, those thoughts this afternoon. And lastly, we have Charles Kahn here. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Kahn. I'm the organizing director at the Strong Economy for All Coalition. Uh, we're a coalition of labor unions and community groups who do a lot of work around state budgets, uh, state taxes, uh, and uh, economic justice. Thanks. Great. Um, I mean, before we get into it here, I kind of want to start with the basics, um, you know, the really essentials of what you need to know about the budget process. And Patrick, I'm going to uh, call on you to sort of take us through the typical timeline of the budget process. What are the steps of the budget cycle? Uh, what are the main milestones in the process? Who are the main actors involved at each point? Um, you know, what are the basics? What do we need to know here if you're a new legislator? Yeah, um, so I'll start by saying why I, I think the focusing on the budget um, in, in this retreat um, is especially important. Um, the budget drives a huge uh, share of the fiscal policy, certainly of the state, um, but also any programming policy that happens during the course of the year. So the state's budget is uh, about $180 billion or more annually um, right now, and, and its scope is, is huge as well. I think it's important to consider that the state budget supports health care for over 6 million New Yorkers enrolled in Medicaid, for 2.6 million students in K-12 schools, and a, a very long, broad list of, of programs and public functions are all supported by the budget and the budget process. Um, so moving into kind of how that works really briefly, I'll, I'll describe uh, the state budget process kind of in, in four main stages. Um, so the budget process is, is guided by the state's constitution, um, specifically Article 7 and other state laws. It's also guided by, by precedent, by how um, things are generally done uh, in the Capitol, and also dictated by the unique circumstances of each budget cycle. Um, so in general, the first, uh, the first stage in the budget cycle is uh, the executive budget 
period and and the state of the state address so this is the period that's basically new year's to valentine's day um it's a really executive driven uh, uh stage of the budget process where uh, the governor has the opportunity to um release the executive's budget proposal um both the laws and and fiscal kind of backing documents the financial plans uh, that support the executive budget, as well as the state of the state address, which has typically kind of been done um, jointly in, in recent years. So during this point, um, the governor releases uh, the executive budget proposal um, and, and the legislature then kind of analyzes what's within that, uh, holds hearings, um, holds meetings at the staff level with the executive's division of the budget and work out what the details in, in the governor's budget are. Um, the governor then also has 30 days at, at most to create some amendments to the proposal. Um, those are typically just kind of technical corrections and, and minor adjustments, but can include any changes. It's around that point, around Valentine's Day, that we move into what we're kind of referring to as, as stage two, um, which is the more internal legislative uh, review of what the governor has put forward um, and development of one house budget bills. So the bills that come out of each of the assembly and the Senate uh, as their kind of stance in the budget process. So that takes us generally from about Valentine's Day to St. Patrick's Day, this second stage. Um, it's also a really important time for, for uh, the members of this panel and, and others, um, advocates and lobbyists to be able to reach out to legislators as well and kind of say, you know, what their response to the executive budget proposal is. Um, at the same time, the, the legislative and, and executive staffs will agree to what uh, reasonable revenue projections are um, for the coming year. So at that point, you get the one house budget bills and the executive budget proposal uh, around St. Patrick's Day. And that's where the kind of nitty gritty of budget negotiation happens uh, between St. Patrick's Day and the end of the fiscal year on March 31st. The uh, three New Yorkers in a room process is, is kind of, uh, you know, chief among the negotiations. Um, but every conference and, and the staffs are meeting constantly with, with increasing frequency um, up to the budget deadline to hammer out all the details of what will be the enacted budget, hopefully um, by March 31st. So um, at that point, that, that third stage kind of ends when you have an enacted uh, budget and the remainder of the year is still an important part of the budget process. Um, the legislature still has a couple months worth of, of session where bills may be passed. Um, typically don't have significant fiscal components or don't have any fiscal components since the budget's already been passed. Um, but the legislative and executive staffs, the division of the budget, are constantly tracking what's actually happened. So as tax revenues are received throughout the year, as spending happens throughout the year, making sure that the state is staying in line with the enacted budget financial plan. Um, and then it starts all over again uh, in January of the next year. So um, it's a really cyclical process that's generally how it plays out. Um, we just wanted to set that up so that we're all kind of singing from the same book um, throughout the rest of this panel. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. I appreciate that. Really helpful in sort of laying down the basics that we're working with here. Um, but obviously, Charles and Scott, you both have, uh, you know, very particular roles in this process as well. You're advocating, you're lobbying. I'm curious if we can talk a bit about what the budget process looks like from your perspective, uh, sort of your perspective on what Patrick just described there. Um, at what point are you getting involved? At what point might you be having contact with legislators? What does that usually look like through each step? Um, whoever wants to jump in there, I'll defer to you. Why don't you go ahead, Charles? I, I'll see, I was gonna see to you as you know our elder statesman. You know, you've put a lot more years in than I have. So I think your wisdom should come first. Age before beauty. Okay, I'll be happy to accept, <laughs> accept that age is a is an objective reality. Uh, thanks. Um, so my perspective um, on this process is shaped by more than 40 years of advocacy uh, at the state capitol. I got my start as an intern uh, working for an assembly member in the uh, late 1970s. Um, and then I uh, worked as a student advocate uh, uh, fighting for affordable tuition and student voting rights. And um, over the years, I've, I've, I've uh, had the privilege of working with lots of different groups and organizations and Pat explained the constitutional and structure, structural process and the timeline um, well, but um, good advocates, and I'm sure this applies to Charles and, 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 and his colleagues, as well as it, as it does to us, um, 
we, we get started much earlier than the ca calendar predicates. Um, in fact, um, I actually don't think for us as advocates, the budget process ever stops. Um, you move from the, uh, and the adoption to the implementation stage, we're all working to either get things done, we weren't successful getting done during the budget or making sure the things we got done or got done to us are implemented in the most, most favorable way. Um, and, you know, in New York, we have a full-time legislature um, and full-time staffs. And so whether it's spring, summer or fall, um, we're actually always uh, working. Something about the budget process here, you know, when you lay out the calendar, it seems like such a nice, orderly, almost extended period. It's it's almost a three month period, but the fact of the matter is, that time moves very quickly. Um, the deadlines approach much faster than expected. Um, the president's week hits, and, and so uh, and then uh, uh, and then as as Patrick uh, laid out, uh, you have the um, the one house budgets in the middle of March. So we're really, first of all, getting in to meet with legislators, putting our coalitions together, organizing our thoughts. Um, you know, we've been doing that for a while and hoping to have our bill sponsors or initiative sponsors talking to the governor. Um, and then as the process goes on, once the governor has delivered the budget proposal to the, to the legislature, our job really shifts to providing information, um, helping engage legislators with the various groups and organizations either support or oppose uh, legislative initiatives. And oftentimes I think the role that we play, and again, I, I think this, this works for advocates like Charles and his colleagues, as well as for us, we're really the connective tissue between all the parties supporting a legislative initiative. Um, to use a sports analogy, um, we help keep the ball in the air and move it down the field or the court, whatever your uh, preference is. So that as the process goes on, the, the things that we care about don't get forgotten about. And hopefully uh, we are contributing to a successful budget adoption, both for our clients, as well as for the legislature and the governor. Yep. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I mean, I think the, the key for the budget process is to start early. Um, and uh, this year, more than any other year, the budget process never ended, right? Like we've been continuing, continuing. But I think um, going back to, to Patrick's calendar, I think January is really as an advocate where you're making sure that all of the legislator, all of the legislators and the governor know what your priorities are, right? It, it's, it's priority setting, right? The governor is gonna set the, his priorities in the state of the state. I think as advocates, my, myself on the grassroots side, we try and start as early as possible, particularly because the governor's pulpit is um, bigger than almost any, likely any other governor in the entire country. And so we know that if we want our priorities to be able to break into the, the uh, legislators' heads and, and into the press, that we have to start early. Um, uh, I also think like, and the budget process is, for me, it's a, a number of races, right? Like the governor releases his, his budget, um, you race to analyze it and then to pivot from that point leading into uh, the February joint budget uh, committee hearings, right? Um, because you wanna know what you need to fight against, what you need to fight for, and you constantly wanna be talking with legislators, you all, um, to make sure that they're also analyzing what was in the governor's budget um, as well and what needs to be added. Right, those budget committee uh, hearings are traditionally super important for us. Um, I represent a lot of people that um, uh, they sometimes feel voiceless, right? They don't necessarily, they, they work nine to fives, multiple nine to fives. And so we try and set up dates where they can really, like legislators can really hear from them. The budget committee hearings are always an important date for that. We're trying as hard as possible to get our perspectives, to get our ideas into the conversation. And from the budget committee hearings, there's a race all the way up until the one house budgets, right? Because uh, the governor loves the budget process. He has more leverage in the budget process than he has in, in session, particularly with a new um, uh, democratic supermajority in both the, the Senate and the assembly. The governor is gonna have a little bit less power than he's had in previous years. 
And so uh, in the budget process, the governor really gets to set a lot of the agenda. The Senate and the assembly get to respond. They, they for more or less, they can only tinker around the edges. Um, but if your priorities do not make it into the one house budgets, they're dead in the water, right? And so it's really a race to the one house budgets, try and get it into the conversation because after those one house budgets uh, uh, come out and they go into what used to be three men in a room and I'm glad it's not three men in a room anymore. Um, uh, once they go in there, transparency, to be frank with you, goes out of the door. Legislators, like veteran legislators to in new incoming legislators will tell you they sometimes a week will go by and they won't hear anything, right? Um, things are kept very tight to the vest. It is a negotiation between a very small number of people. And so my job as an advocate is to get, to build up as much rapport and, and energy um, and capital as I can before the, it becomes closed door meetings because it is notoriously difficult um, to influence those meetings because it's so hard to get information from what is going on. And so I think that's that's likely to be the case this year. I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about what the priorities are gonna be, but that's how I look at the, the, the budget. I'm, I think it's gonna be more difficult than past years to be frank. Um, it's always a luxury and a pleasure to be able to bring people for the first time to Albany to like see the Capitol. It's a beautiful building to talk to legislators. You don't necessarily have to get on their calendar to be able to talk to them. And now if you can't schedule them for a Zoom, it's gonna be very, it's gonna be uphill. And so uh, it's gonna be a, a legislative session like no other. We've got a lot of holes to fill. And so um, uh, as much as the information that we'll give you for this next upcoming uh, budget session, we have a lot of questions ourselves. You you both mentioned, you know, it starts earlier than uh, may seem official to the process. Is it fair to say you're both sort of in it right now? Yes. For months. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. uh, and, you know, Charles uh, mentioned uh, my age. Well, back when I started, you know, the, the process was fairly compact. Uh, governor introduced the budget, legislature, they negotiate. And obviously there were years when it wasn't done on time, but you know, they legislature gaveled out in early June um, and legislators returned to the districts to do constituent work. Um, I think as Charles and I have already related, this is a year round process. And a very important point, Charles mentioned the, um, the leverage of the governor, the authority of the governor, the budget process, it's, abs it's absolutely true, but you, particularly new legislators should be aware of the effectiveness and the ability of the legislature to be powerful. Um, the new legislators are joining a group of incredibly talented men and women. And this, not only are the elected officials really the top, the top line, but the staffs are outstanding. And uh, we spend a lot of time making our clients and folks understand that as important as it is to talk to, to, to the legislators, it's also important to talk to the staffs. The staffs play such a significant role for the legislators and they're really talented, they're really smart. And I haven't had, uh, I can't think of a meeting I've had on, on a fiscal issue, talking with a member or a staffer where I haven't come away learning something myself, not just giving them information. Um, I mean, a lot of the time I imagine when you're heading into this process, you're calling upon existing relationships with legislators and their staffs. When you have new legislators coming into the process, how are you reaching out to them? What should they be expecting uh, from your end? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it starts um, early, right? Like, uh, I think uh, I always, because I'm um, and an advocate and a community organizer. Um, I do a lot kind of outside of the budget. And so there are many different opportunities to engage with uh, legislators beforehand, especially when they're running. You know, they're often trying to learn, figure out what policies they want to craft to become their platform. And that's usually uh, a good opportunity to build relationships, right? Not everyone you build relationships with will um, will win, but every relationship is valuable, right? Both um, as an advocate to legislators and a legislators to advocates. Um, and so uh, for the most part, I hope to, I like my coalition has already met and introduced themselves to legislators. I think um, 
typically in January, it may be a good time to get face to face, particularly with legislators that are not that don't live near where I live in the city. Um, and so it's I start early before they've even been elected with with new legislators um, to build trust and to build rapport. And I, I think this year, Charles has pointed out, it's, it's, it's much tougher, it's much more difficult, um, but it's a, a re polite requests to legislators, especially newly elected ones. And of course, depending on the, the legislator, they're in a different part of the process. So we have uh, spoken to some folks uh, while they were campaigning, uh, speaking to some folks after they've uh, been successfully elected and some folks are, are still getting sorted. In our case, um, my focus more is on having our clients uh, introduce themselves to the legislators. You know, most of our clients are are either local advoc advocacy groups or local associations of of businesses or some other profession, um, or or local business in the individual businesses. And it's important if they don't already have a relationship with that with their legislators to understand what role they play in their community. Those are really the most important relationships for me to see them build. Um, eventually, uh, hopefully I look forward to meeting all the new members of the Senate and the assembly, whether it's via Zoom or once we can engage in person. I mean, since you both mentioned that, um, we do wanna get into you know what the budget will look like this year, both in substance and the process itself. I guess we can start with the process aspect, um, you know, it's going to look different this year as the pandemic continues. We know it's not um, going away soon. Uh, one obvious change that I think Charles, you alluded to is that um, we're not going to be seeing advocates to the same extent at the Capitol uh, demonstrating things like that. Um, a lot of this work is going to be happening remotely. Um, what, what is that going to mean for, for the changes in the process? And, and are there other changes in store? How does that affect uh, your work? How might that change what legislators can expect uh, in interacting with the different actors involved? Whoever wants to start weighing in on that one. Well, um, our office is located directly across from the Capitol. So uh, I can provide firsthand account that advocacy is alive and well in the state Capitol. Um, uh, that, uh, that the demonstrators are still regularly around the Capitol. And in some ways they might actually get more notice now because of the change of, of, of conditions. Um, and, but it's gonna challenge all of us. Um, there's a, there's the, the connectivity is different in person versus virtual. So if you don't have existing relationships, um, it's, it's gonna be a bit challenging. Um, there's, no doubt in my mind that the work over the last nine months has been more intense and not just because the issues uh, have been uh, so demanding, but because of the work, uh, of, of the nature of the work. Uh, Zooms are good, uh, but in the in a 30 minute Zoom that I can have with someone, I might have three or four conversations outside the uh, assembly or Senate chamber. Um, it, it, it means we have to um, be agile as to the how of advocacy, uh, ready to respond to the changing environment, be creative. Um, and and I, I, Charles mentioned this earlier, uh, this year's budget and likely next year's budget will be very difficult because of the situation we're working under. Uh, that could depend obviously on the results of the Georgia Senate races, uh, an all democratic uh, uh, federal uh, government would would obviously improve our situation. Um, and that changes the dynamic uh, about what you're asking for, what you're doing and, and, and how you do it. Um, it, means, it, it, it means being even more prepared and, and learning. And every, it's interesting, each, each legislator in each office is having their own uh, cadence of how they like to do things. And so it's like, it's like learning about other aspects of a relationship you've had for a long time. I, Annie, I always knew uh, that, that you like uh, music, but I didn't know you liked art as well. So that's kind of the, 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 the developing of the relationship. Um, in some ways, I have found this process actually over the last months to be more productive and um, the connectivity, uh, at least with our existing relationships to be deeper. Um, 
uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, others feel the same way about it. Yeah, I, I really think that this year is going to test um, as an advocate our, our creativity. Um, I, when I look at the, the 2021 budget process, there are huge crises in front of New York. Um, new, they were gonna have to figure out some, what to do about evictions and rent relief, um, uh, about Medicaid and healthcare spending, about school spending, about excluded workers. Um, and, and let's also not forget about small businesses, right? Like the federal government put together a plan that helped a lot of big businesses, but a lot of small businesses, particularly restaurants um, are, if you know, if they close again, they, they may never reopen. And so um, typically in Albany, um, uh, as a community advocate, I can play a numbers game, right? Like the, the people that I represent are working class people. Some of them are very poor. Some of them are homeless. Um, they don't have a lot of, of money, which you know has a lot of sway in Albany. Um, but what we do have is numbers on our side because that's the majority of New Yorkers. And um, we're often able to show up in the Capitol in big numbers, right? To show like, this is the average person. Um, hear from them, see them, right? Look at them. Uh, I can convey a story, but having you know hundreds of people convey the story themselves, um, missing, not having lobby days is going to be a really, really difficult um, um, process. And so it's really going to test our creativity to energize and support legislators that are on our side, and to spark um, uh, new perspectives in legislators that maybe haven't heard from these constituencies before um, or um, legislators that are thinking about where they uh, position themselves on new or potentially controversial ideas. And so it's going to take a lot of creativity in order to do that. Um, and, and because of um, uh, uh, the, the budget crisis that's happening, I think taxes and revenue is going to be a huge, huge fight um, that's really going to dictate what, what kinds of relief we're going to be able to offer to New Yorkers. Um, because, you know, I don't want to like bring the federal government into this, but it really seems like a lot of hopes were put on a triple blue uh, federal government and that's not going to happen. And I think that's going to put New York in a very, very difficult position. I know the governor was putting kind of all of his uh, uh, eggs in the basket of a, a big federal relief plan, but that's that's not going to happen. It's, it's too late for too many people. Um, and so New York State's going to have to step up to the plate and uh, it's going to be a big fight. And, and uh, I think creativity is going to win the day. I think on process too, um, just one quick point that one reason to be cautiously optimistic as well is that we been doing the virtual information sharing for, for nine months now. You know, in the heat of budget negotiation last year, that kind of stage three was when the pandemic was really settling in in New York or, or you know, kind of sending people home from work and things like that. So as, as Scott and Charles both pointed out, not only legislators have gotten somewhat used to, to this type of communicating, um, but staffs too. So um, I think, you know, that's one valuable thing that, that will uh, be different in this budget cycle is, is that people are, are somewhat used to this uh, virtual information sharing. Yeah, we do have a sort of better handle on at least the technology aspect of it uh, so far. Um, I mean, since we're sort of already getting at it already, um, I'm curious what you all think the uh, you know the main topics of debate, the sticking points uh, both within the legislature but also between the legislature and the executive are going to be this year. Obviously, the in, the umbrella uh, problem looming over all of us right now is the budget crisis. Um, what what are going to be sort of the the flashpoints? Um, Patrick, I imagine you've been looking at this uh, to some extent already. Yeah, I mean the. Balancing the budget is is going to be the lion's share of the discussion for good reason. Um, you know, we're looking at the most recent DOB projections are revenue losses of about fifteen billion dollars annually uh, over the life of the financial plan, which is, is four years. Um, those are the current estimates. Now, there's been some federal uh, relief in in the form of uh, COVID relief funds to respond directly to the pandemic, um, but also some assistance in uh, uh, school aid, um, over a billion dollars there, and also an increased federal financial participation in the Medicaid program. So there's been a few billion dollars there already kind of realized, but that still leaves an $8 billion 
uh, you know, unsolved gap just in the next year. Um, and that continues and grows into the out year. So balancing the budget is, is going to be the discussion. Um, and then, you know, there might be some other policy issues along the way. Um, but I think everything can and should be on the table. You know, at CBC, we kind of have this framework of, of five main options for these types of hard choices. Um, one is to use revenues. The other is to raise taxes. Um, the third being to decrease spending. Um, the, the fourth being to sell assets, which is a, a really kind of marginal um, option. And then the, the fifth is to borrow. So I think all of those things will be discussed and should be discussed in this budget process because it, it is a, a massive gap um, awaiting federal relief. Uh, for for yeah. Tom, Scott, what about you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with Patrick. Um, I, I think we'll all agree. It's gonna be finding a balance in the budget. Um, the budget, right, is a, is a moral document um, and it's gonna test our morals this year. Uh, we're looking at huge budget deficits. I think we um, on the advocate side, on the community side have been really looking at a, a three-pronged approach, right? Which is uh, raise revenues, like raise taxes um, uh, on the super wealthy, only the super wealthy um, to, to expand the pie so that we have the resources to invest and fill the holes that we're, we're going to see in the next year and the out years. Uh, find low cost borrowing. We know the, it's kind of wonky, but the Federal Reserve had a really golden opportunity to offer cities and states really, really low cost loans. Um, uh, and with, you know, ja Janet Yellen, you know, taking over uh, a lot of uh, uh, national fiscal policy, there may be another opportunity there um, to, to borrow. Um, and then, yes, like the push for the federal government to, to offer some money. Uh, but we don't want to wait around for that. So I think for New York, particularly, it's, it's really going to be about raising revenues. Um, you look at the, the tax structure in New York, it's pretty flat. There's been an explosion of wealth at the top, right, since the beginning of the pandemic in March. We've seen the wealth of billionaires in the state expand $77 billion. Just that expansion since March is bigger than New York State's entire budget deficit, right? Um, we also know that uh, um, overdoses are skyrocketing. Homelessness is skyrocketing. We are on the verge of a um, uh, eviction crisis. And so we see, we see how the economy is like continuing to shift in this really unbalanced way. And so next year is really going to be about how can we adjust, right, raise some revenues in, in the budget in a really meaningful way to offer support, because that's really going to be the counter cyclical spending that's required in order to boost the economy. Like that's the stimulus that slingshots us out of this downturn into a position of power, particularly across the country, um, uh, and getting through this economic crisis faster. It's, it's kind of the big lesson that was learned in 2008 is that states that went with austerity, state that went with, that went with cuts and decided to, to slash public jobs and not offer assistance, it took them longer to get out of uh, the economic depression. And this economic depression is threatening to be much, much worse than the past. So we're gonna have to, um, to, re to really act in a meaningful way. Last time we passed a millionaire's tax, uh, that rate this year, that accounts for about $7 billion. And so we're gonna need to pass taxes in excess of that because we're dealing with a bigger problem. Um, most New Yorkers support it. And so it's really gonna be figuring out what's the best way to do it in the budget. So Annie, I would certainly agree that uh, responding to the pandemic is gonna dominate the discussion uh, this year. Um, in my view, all aspects of the response, though, are going to be on the table, the public health, the state's fiscal health, and the state's economic health. Um, and every year, I think the, the story of the budget is balancing all of those issues that Charles, that Charles laid out. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't have a prediction for how it's going to turn out or what will be the issues, but uh, in, in preparing for what's ahead of us, um, you know, we've looked back. Uh, history is is not a perfect guide, but it it certainly is it, it is a resource. And um, the last time the state fa faced anything like this kind of a of a mess, uh, the response um, included a combination of uh, revenue increases, 
uh, new revenue measures and cuts in spending. Um, and I, I take Charles's point about the reduction in spending, but certainly that's going to be on. Certainly, I, I, we as advocates have to be prepared for there to be folks talking about reducing spending as, as part of that conversation. Another lesson from the past is that the final package will likely include some of these large items that you're uh, hearing discussed that are uh, Annie, you and your colleagues are writing about, Charles and his colleagues are, are championing, but um, there'll also be a lot of small measures, um, a lot of small revenue raisers, new revenues, and uh, we try and would encourage others not to get lost only in the conversation about wh whether to tax the wealthy or how much to tax the wealthy or what, what to define as a wealthy New Yorker. Um, I'm absolutely confident Charles and his colleagues and uh, we'll all be engaged in that discussion going forward, but there's gotta be, there's gonna be a lot of other elements to make this up. Um, uh, you know, the governor's made the point you can't close this gap. If you did all of the revenue raisers, um, that certainly sounds uh, like a reasonable position. Um, and so uh, think about all of those things that could possibly happen and be on guard. Remember the calendar that Patrick laid out for, from us before. Really, it's not until mid-February that the executive budget is complete. And then the legislature has only a couple of weeks to shape their one house budgets. And then the scariest part of this process for all of us is in those two weeks after, hopefully after the one house budgets till the final budget is enacted. Um, and, and, and so look for lots to be on the table, including many things you never thought about. Yeah, good, good heads up on that. Um, we have a number of questions rolling in now. Just want to remember, uh, remind all of our audience members. If you have a question for our panelists, please submit it in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as of those as possible as we wrap up here. Um, one question for you guys: You might know based on experience, right now, are legislators taking in-person meetings right now? It's a mix. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, it, it, it's been a mix. Um, I'm, I'm, I live in Brooklyn. There's a lot of legislators that live around. I've been speaking to most of them by, by Zoom, um, uh, particularly because we're, we're in a spike right now. And you know, City and State did a great article about the numbers right now. And so they're, for the most part, the ones that I usually talk to uh, are shying away from in person. But I think, you know, maybe a a month ago, it was possible to do an in-person, but not really. I haven't had an in-person meeting with someone in the public policy space since March 12th, wow. I think it was. Um, and I think I've only had one or two total meetings and they were in outdoor settings when the other party requested it. Um, yeah, so it's a change process. But as I said earlier, I, I think it's been very productive. And I've found that this is where the work you've done before to build relationships, build trust, build credibility, whether you're an individual lobbyist or uh, an organization, an independent organization, individual, uh, this is where all that work you've done before really, really is benefiting you. Um, another question from the audience here. Uh, can each one of the panelists address where we are at on the education budget? Uh, specifically as it relates to equity in urban districts and for charter schools? Um, so I would say that uh, it looked a lot. So New York State um, overall um, ranks uh, kind of near the bottom on educational equity. Uh, in part, that's due to the fact that uh, local um, localities pay the third highest uh, share uh, of uh, like state but in the state budget uh, across the entire country. And so um, a lot of uh, school funding comes from localities, right? And that's that's why property taxes in New York are so high. It happened when Pataki cut taxes at the top and he said it would pay for itself and it didn't. And localities were like, how do we pay for schools? And so they raised property taxes. And so I think it, it's been a, it's always a constant battle because the schools do need more money. and. Uh, localities know there's a limit 
but well, they're not, there's limit, but like property taxes, putting the school budgets on them is just really, really difficult. The state should be paying more. And that's gonna be a fight uh, in, in the next year, right? Particularly because we need more money for schools. Cause it seems like as we've been figuring things out, many children have kind of lost, you know, a school year. And so we're gonna have to invest more money to kind of jumpstart them and get them back on track so that, you know, they're graduating um, prepared uh, to like succeed. Um, and so I, I don't, I can't, I don't really know. I don't know if Patrick knows like what the, the deficit is gonna look like, but it's definitely gonna be in the billions of dollars. Education is one of the, the biggest um, spending items as it should be uh, in the state budget. Yeah, um, I think the, the budget, hole that we're looking at right now i think eight billion to nine billion dollars is the number that we're kind of going with um based on the last update to the state's financial plan charles is right in in the context of the budget um uh, on the state funds basis um education is the single largest program in the budget um with with medicaid shortly behind which also has a lot of federal funding um but education is is the area where where the state spends the most and you know, on, on a kind of uh, interstate basis on a, for uh, each student, New York State spends uh, almost two times more than the national average. So, you know, on a comparative basis and internally in the state budget, it, it is a huge area of, of the budget. And, and I think the, the, the point that Charles is, has brought up um, is, is that uh, with the budget situation being so dire and, and new funding being very limited or or non-existent um targeting especially any increases in in education spending to the neediest districts um in in the areas where uh local support isn't as available um is is really important as a uh, former school board member here in the city of albany um i don't think we talk enough about the challenges in education aid um the disparities uh, between uh, richer and poorer communities in New York and education. And while certainly the, the data will, will represent that it's heaviest in black and brown communities, there's lots of rural communities throughout the state where um, there's similar problems in, in terms of high needs. Uh, this pandemic has been even more devastating the lack of connectivity, the lack of availability of devices. Um, uh, as a school board member, um, the budget was as big a deal um, there as it is as a, as a legislator. Um, and money isn't everything, but it is a significant part of the, of the conversation. And the disparity in education aid, uh, the lack of resources available uh, to all the children, not on an equal basis, but at least on a on a minimal basis, is something uh, that is one of the great challenges that the governor and the legislature have to sort out in this crisis. Uh, we have yeah. some. The, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the one thing I would add is, uh, whoever, I don't know who asked that question, but um, Jasmine Gripper is on one of the following panels. She's like a master of education, so pose the question to her and she'll have a better answer than all of us. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Or, yeah, that's actually, we have an education panel at uh, 2.50 as well. Um, so should get covered a lot later on this afternoon. Um, there's some, some discussion happening in the, in the chat box here about um, whether taxing the ultra rich will uh, lead to an exodus. Is that an effective uh, revenue generating strategy here? A question, are there any plan Bs toward generating revenue um, if that is the case? Uh, Charles, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, capital flight, um, the myth of the moving millionaires is something that we hear a lot, particularly from the governor. Um, it, um, I think it um, appeals to some common sensibilities that people have, but the data, that's not what the data shows. Um, uh, what the data has shown is that uh, taxes are one of many, many things that the very wealthy consider when they think about leaving a state or moving into a state. Um, and that when taxes are raised, the wealthy are actually the least likely to leave, right? The people that are most likely to leave a state 
um, are actually between the ranges of 25 and 40, the people that are trying to figure out where they want to uh, kind of set up shop. Um, and those people are not the people that taxes on the wealthy are, are impacting, right? Those are the people that taxes on the wealthy are actually benefiting because they see um, they see the benefits of the investments, the investments in their community. And so um, what we saw in 2009, when we were trying to deal with the recession was that uh, the state uh, instituted a millionaire's tax. Today, it would raise roughly $7 billion. There was a lot of similar talk about millionaires and billionaires packing up and leaving because they have so much money, it's easy for them to do. But that's not what we saw. What we saw is an 80% growth in the number of millionaires since 2009. Uh, even even during this pandemic, um, what we've seen is a growth in billionaires, right? We have two more billionaires after the pandemic, or we're still in the pandemic, than what we had before. And so capital flight is not the threat that uh, some folks may claim that it's going to be. Uh, there will be anecdotal millionaires and billionaires that choose to leave. You know, Trump said he's leaving New York and going to Florida, like that will happen. But overall, uh, the vast majority of millionaires and billionaires are going to stay. There are studies that say that a, a tax rate raise, we may lose like 1%. Um, but if we are raising revenues at the end of the day, even if a handful leave, we'll have more money and more resources uh, to fill these holes and to invest in the communities. Um, so it's a very valid question, but it's not something that the data uh, over a long, long period of time shows actually happens. Yeah, I, I think it's important too that the just to offer a, a slight counterpoint that this situation is is very different in important areas than 2009 was first of all in 2009 implemented the millionaires tax um that is mostly still in place so that uh, extension of those rates a couple of times over kind of removes that arrow from the quiver a little bit um the the rates could go back up a little bit to 2009 levels um the situation is is also and different, uh, different because of the fact that um, you know New Yorkers have gotten somewhat used to both individuals and firms maybe moving somewhere else temporarily during the pandemic, um, learning how to work virtually. Um, I think that could change uh, in ways that 2009 didn't. How people and firms are are choosing to locate as well. So, with amenities closed and and some inertia behind. Uh, working from home or you know remote telecommuting i think the situation is is also a little bit different um but absolutely new york state relies significantly on on the highest income uh earners so one in every five dollars in in uh the state's tax revenue in a given year is just the personal income taxes on the top one percent so it does create some some volatility as well and annie one one brief point i would make is that we need to be specific when we're talking about proposals. Uh, tax the wealthy, tax the super rich is a slogan. Um, and um, But there are a number of different initiatives that I've seen rolled out that uh, try to attach itself to that. And uh, analysts, policymakers, advocates, we need to look beneath the slogan and see what the proposal actually does, who it actually taxes um, without with without taking a position uh, on either side of this issue, um, what exactly are we proposing, and what will be the impact of that specific proposal? Who will it actually impact? Yeah, I I think that's that is super super key. Um, I think the the other alternative to taxing the rich, I think that we've seen a little bit, is things that are are more regressive. You know, sales taxes, taxes on uh, like cannabis and uh, um, like casino license, like casino, like sports betting, those kinds of things. Those are taxes that can generate a decent amount of money, but those are also taxes that are taxing working and poor people that are already bearing the brunt of this pandemic. And that's why I think the focus on tax on the wealthy is really important. Uh, Patrick is right that the wealthy are paying a, a large share of the state's income taxes, but that's because they're taking an even larger share of all of the money that's created in the state. If you're looking at the uh, the effective tax rate of the wealthiest people in the state, they're actually paying less in state taxes than folks that are making $20,000 a year. And so although they're paying a large amount relative to what they make, they're actually paying a smaller amount than everyone else. And that's why that's a common sense place to go when we're looking at providing relief to small businesses, to restaurants, to tenants, uh, to parents, 
uh, to excluded workers. I mean, I think that's the, the, the path uh, to go that, um, um, you know, that's, that's my opinion. We, um, I wish we had time to discuss more of this in more detail and get to the rest of the questions in the uh, Q&A box from our audience members. I will hopefully leave those to be answered in uh, our forthcoming panels. But I want to thank you all, all panelists for getting on today and giving us this really helpful uh, explainer, um, some insight and, and some predictions for what lies ahead uh, in the coming weeks and months uh, for this next, next budget uh, season. With that, uh, thank you all and I'll pass it off to Zach Williams. Thanks a lot, Annie. Uh, that was a really great discussion. Um, thank you to all the panelists, um, you know, people of great expertise of this extremely complicated state budget process. Um, you know, as someone that's covered the legislation for a couple of years now, it's always fascinating to just see all the different parts that go into this. Um, the assembly, the Senate, the governor's office are obvious, but the state budget process also involves every local government across the state, countless advocacy organizations, and uh, so, so much else. And our next discussion is really going to focus on how, um, you know, state new state lawmakers really got to know not only how to work with their colleagues and with the executive branch, but also with um, the local governments in their own district. Leading that discussion is going to be Jeff Colton, one of our great staff reporters at City and State, and I'm going to turn it over to him to talk about intergovernmental affairs. Thank you so much, Zach. That's right. I'm Jeff Colton, senior reporter at City and State, uh, and I am the kind of the city hall focused guy. Zach is kind of the state capital focused guy. So needless to say, I know a lot about intergovernmental affairs, you know, Zach and I talk all the time, but, uh, you know, I have uh, only from a journalistic perspective. Uh, luckily, we have four absolute experts uh, that are on joining us on this panel today. Um, I'm actually going to let them introduce themselves, uh, but we want to talk about intergovernmental affairs. We're going to talk about a little bit about lobbying. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, how to make uh, friends out of enemies in your district and uh, hopefully keep them friends. Um, so I'll start out by, uh, yeah, just asking us to go around to our four panelists. Uh, if each of you could introduce yourself uh, in under a minute, we want to keep this moving. Introduce yourself and uh, kind of tell us uh, what experience are bringing to this conversation? What is your experience with intergovernmental affairs or what's your experience uh, in Albany and state government generally? Uh, we'll, I'll start at the top of my screen. So uh, Craig Johnson, why don't you go ahead? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, my name is Craig Johnson. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Long Point Advisors. It's a boutique government affairs lobbying firm based uh, downstate in Long Island, but do a lot of uh, my work up in Albany, New York City, and uh, really across the state. Um, I've been on both sides of this, uh, currently a lobbyist and do a lot of government affairs work, but I also uh, did a bit of time in Albany on the elected side. I served two terms in the New York State Senate. Um, I was there uh, when the last, uh, when we passed the millionaire's tax. So I kind of have a little bit of a different point of view uh, than some uh, on the issue. And I also served as a member of the Nassau County Legislature before that. So I kind of bring at it as on both sides of it. I sat on both sides of the table. Thank you, Craig. I uh, hand it over to Michael Hardaway. If you could introduce yourself, uh, what you do and what you have done. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, I'm Michael Hardaway. I am head of Hardaway Wire, which is a political intelligence startup. Uh, we help CEOs make smarter decisions. Uh, spent about 15 years in government, beginning with Barack Obama in the United States Senate and on through the presidency. Uh, and most recently as head of messaging and communications for Hakeem Jeffries, both in his personal office and in his leadership office. All right, thank you, Michael. We will definitely be asking you about uh, interfacing with, with DC. Uh, Diana Ostroff, please uh, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Diana Ostroff with Ostroff Associates. We're a government relations firm that represents a diverse range of clients from small nonprofit organizations to Fortune 500 corporations. Um, we have a team of 22 people um, that work in all throughout New York State. And I personally have been lobbying for 27 years. Excellent, thank you, Diana. And uh, last on to Robert Diamond, please. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, great to be with everybody. Um, Rob Diamond, uh, I'm a partner at uh, Capital Council and, and work uh, both at the city, state and, and federal level. Uh, 
most recently served as the state director for the Biden uh, Harris campaign here in New York. So uh, work both on the governmental and the political side. Uh, I've served in the uh, Obama White House as a special assistant to the president. So a lot of time at the federal level, uh, as well as the director of intergovernmental affairs for Governor Cuomo uh, for a couple of years. So uh, uh, a lot of time uh, in the executive branch, uh, both at the state and federal level. Excellent. So glad to have all of you here. Uh, we're going to try and keep this conversation really free flowing. By all means, you know, jump in, talk with each other. But I do want to remind uh, all of our uh, viewers and uh, people joining us, uh, please keep it going on the chat. And uh, by all means, ask questions in the Zoom Q&A function. I'm going to try and get to those uh, and ask some specific questions later on in the chat. Um, I wanted to just open up conversation at the beginning uh, by saying, what's the best way to build support for an issue? Uh, if you are a state legislator, or even if you're you know, a member of an interest group uh, trying to work across uh, governmental lines here, what is the best way to build support? Uh, so it's a broad question. And I'll start again uh, with Craig for this one. You know, How do you do this? Yeah, so I think there are a number of, of ways to approach it. And I think um, all my panelists would probably agree that we all are professional advocates. Um, you know, we are, we are lobbyists because we were required to register as lobbyists. We all believe in transparency. I think that when it comes to building on an issue, it's important to use the advocates who are in support of the issue to help you with your cause. When I served in the state legislature, oftentimes meeting with a lobbyist on a whole variety of issues who were supportive of, of the positions I was taking or, or the bills that I sponsored, we would work together collaboratively to find ways to build that support. Oftentimes uh, the lobbyists or the advocates you work with have relationships with members that go pretty deep or long lasting relationships. And so you can actually you know, work with and use those advocates who come to speak to you and come to lobby you to help you build uh, build on your cause. I think that's a very effective way. And you know, we're here to really help. We, you know, Diana talks about her 27 years experience. You know, I had working with her on a number of issues when I was in the state legislature. You know, she's a tremendous advocate, and that that's the type of experience you need to have because we really do know a lot of the ins and outs. And this year, as the last panelist talked about, is going to be very unique. It's going to be a very trying year both on the budget side of things with a multi-billion dollar budget deficit, but also the fact that a lot of us aren't going to be in Albany. And so that's the great opportunity to use, you know, folks such as ourselves to help you guide through the process and gain the support that you need to have on a piece of legislation. If I can add to that as well, what we do and what we bring to the table is, yes, we have expertise from our clients and we bring data and information on topics but we also build coalitions very regularly. So we know who else might have similar opinions to ours or wanna advocate on an issue. And we bring those groups together all the time on issues. And we can be a help, we can be a big help to legislators and we're looking to help you. And you know, if we're supportive of a bill, we wanna help you know, get that bill passed. So we're gonna help you do whatever we can. On the opposite side, if it's something we do oppose, I'm going to be honest with you because you're new members and, you know, we don't always agree on everything and, you know, we could be working on 10 issues and one we don't agree on and the nine others we agree on. But the one great thing about working with the lobbyists and talking with lobbyists, you get a different perspective from every point of view. You get to analyze the data you're given and make decisions based on the data gathered. We can bring one perspective, we can come to the table, we can negotiate, um, we can compromise. I mean, I think you just got off campaigns where everyone is you know, quick to criticize everybody in government, but now it's the time to come together and get things done. And in order to do that, there is compromise that has to be made. And a lot of times it's bringing all the lobbyists in and having a conversation with everyone to try to come to a resolution everyone is happy with and get something done. Jeff, if I could just add one, one more piece to that, I would just say, um, you know, holistically in terms of building an advocacy campaign, um, you know, you've got, you've got to think of all the tools in the toolbox. And, and so, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, you've got to, and you've got to meet people where they're at. And so um, there are powerful social media tools to inform uh, the public and, and grassroots support. Um, we're talking about intergovernmental affairs. So, you know, talking to other elected officials 
uh, in your in your locality, up and down the food chain, all the way up through your congressional delegation, all the way down uh, to local boards of supervisors. Um, um, is there a press strategy? Is there a media strategy? Do you want to engage with reporters? Uh, all the way up through the lobbying and, and walking the halls and building consensus among members. So it's really, really about that holistic kind of 21st century approach to, to advocacy that, that uh, I think, um, and, 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 and with the advent of social media, there, there are tools in people's hands today that you know, we didn't have five, 10 years ago uh, to, to really build awareness um, um, and build engagement uh, on specific issues. Now, speaking of social media, I mean, we're being told uh, all of us are being hit from so many different angles about issues. You know, sometimes you see something on social media, sometimes you get a phone call, an email, uh, you know, for Michael for this one, but really for any of you, I mean, do elected officials uh, find it easier or harder to uh, ignore uh, a fellow elected official than, you know, advocates or lobbyists or, or that sort of thing? You know, is there a different uh, medium, different message here? Sure, I think as it relates to social media for campaigns, it's incredibly effective in a separate way, but in a related way to the groups, right? And I think legislators as they're making decisions and figure out what coalitions they have, they often look at both sides as it relates to the traditional ways, like which groups are with me, but also what is the energy on social media? Who are the key people that are advocating for this thing? And are those people influential enough to be helpful or hurtful um, to whatever the cause is that we're working on at the moment. And so I think, you know, social media in some way has risen significantly, but um, it's about on par with the support of the groups. Um, and I think that, you know, it, as we move forward, it'll be incredibly important to make sure that the information that um, members of Congress and elected officials receive on social media in terms of the energy um, is accurate. And I think that's something that they're sorting through at the moment and have not been able to sort through um, as it relates to um, bots and sort of fake accounts and those sorts of problems um, that manipulate those numbers. But I think that social media has risen significantly and it will continue. I want to stay on this topic about social media. I find it so interesting. And, and we're talking about building relationships across governmental, uh, you know, different areas, building uh, support, you know, what role does social media play? And then sometimes is it more harmful than hurtful here? I think you have to be careful with it uh, for a couple of viewpoints. I'll look at it first from the, elect, uh, from the elected official. You know, all too often people don't take a breath when it comes to social media. I, I've learned sometimes the hard way that before you send a tweet or post something on Facebook, read it a couple of times and make sure it's something you really want to post, right? And I think that all too often elected officials, especially using social media, try to jump out in front of an issue without doing any particular diligence. I think the other, uh, the other week, there was a little bit of a, a spat between members of Congress and the state legislature over a proposed $3 fee involving Amazon. And it really came down to the fact that one member posted you know, opposition to it and another member had to kind of come out and say, you didn't even read the bill. And, and you know, your, your position is just flat out you know, wrong. And I think you have to be careful about that because you've created both an embarrassing situation, but also you're, you're creating an enemy when it's not necessary. And so you have to kind of watch out about that. The other thing you have to, I think, watch out with social media is despite maybe all of us who use it, there are a lot of people who don't use it. And as an elected official, It'll be very interesting to see the post-COVID uh, reaction. Right now, social media is important, I think, for elected officials who want to get their message out, who aren't able to either campaign or meet constituents in person. But, you know, especially senior citizens, they're not on Twitter, folks. I mean, they may be on Facebook, but they're not necessarily engaging with elected officials on it. You know, sometimes it's shoe leather, sometimes it's old-fashioned mail, sometimes it's knocking on the doors that's gonna get you the contact with the voter that you need to have going forward. And so people get caught up in social media that you see my post, did you see what I, what I said? And a lot of times elected uh, constituents are gonna be like, nope, didn't see it because I'm not on Twitter and I'm not on Instagram and I'm not on, you know, you, you name it. So I think we're gonna see after COVID, um, a lot of people are gonna to have to hit the streets and figure out how to re-engage with their constituents on a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, one-on-one basis. 
uh, more on this. I mean, gosh, if you're, <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued by that that example. You know, when we're talking about uh, Assemblymember Robert Carroll and uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, just to put some names to it for those who didn't I tried see. Try not do names. Uh, I was trying to be polite <laughs> and uh, keep it. Uh, I'll, I'll be the one to say that. Not that okay. <laughs> you reported um, on it, Jeff, so it's okay. Exactly. I mean, so, you know, in that situation, um, I guess, you know, how would, uh, how would any of you handle this if you're, if you're dealing with another member of government, you know, is the best way to, to do it publicly to kind of clear the air, or uh, is it often better to deal uh, privately kind of back channel with uh, other elected officials? Jeff, if I could jump out, I'd just take a step back, because I, I, I think Craig brought up an important point, um, and just to expound on that, which is, um, you know, it really matters what, what platform you're talking about, you know, when you talk about social media. I mean, Twitter is different from Facebook, is different from Instagram, is different from, you know, the 18 other things that, that, that pop up every day um, <laughs> for, that the, the kids are on these days. Um, but, um, you know, and, and, and the audiences are different. Uh, and I mean that in, in all seriousness. And, and, you know, Twitter is, 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 a, is, a, is where the political establishment sort of, and the media and, and the Albany Press Corps and others are, are present and you and there are dialogues on there and, and there is you know um, a, a voice to be had there. Um, the tools that Facebook provides for you know advocacy campaigns, political campaigns uh, to target and and, and share information uh, and segment is is like we've never had before and really understanding how to leverage those tools to to talk to people um, in different groups and with different messages is very powerful. Um, again, there, you know, I, I, I can lump email into, into kind of social media if you want to in this regard as far as an information source and the ability to, again, target, segment, test uh, messaging. I mean, these are very sophisticated tools these days um, to engage with constituents, build consensus, share information, uh, or, or on the other side, you know, a, 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 attack something you don't disagree with. So um, I do think you have to, in, in, in 2020, going into 2021, you know, have uh, people in your on your team, in your orbit, on your staff, uh, or you know who you work with, who who understand these digital tools, um, because it's just where you know it's where people are. And especially when the Capitol is closed and there's no person to person meeting, we're all going to be relying on different forms of social media to get our issues out. I think yeah. one yeah. of the to circle back. And oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Go ahead. Your question, though. Uh, it's my perspective that if you're looking to be effective in terms of communicating with other elected officials, picking up the phone is always the best way to go. And I've always discouraged members of Congress from, first of all, operating their own social media account directly, but emotionally responding publicly to any of these things because you never, there are no victories here. And at the end of the day, you make an enemy that you didn't have to make, as was said earlier. And so I think the direct way is always the best way offline, personally, and you sort it out. Yeah, just to build off what Michael was talking about, when I was a senator, I kind of operate on the idea there's no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. But the caveat to that is, is if you sandbag somebody, if you go out there without a heads up and take a position and embarrass that member, um, and I'm not saying, you know, the story about the $3 wasn't embarrassing or, or would be treated as such. But if you do that, I think you create a tone which is unnecessary. But if you, if somebody takes a position that you're opposed to, if they've, you know, maybe, you know, take a tax position that is hurtful for you in your district, and if you pick up the phone and say, look, I got to go out there and take a position that you may not be, you know, in favor of, but I got to do this for my constituency. We're all, they were all elected officials. We were all elected officials. We understood what we had to do. But if you're just going to run out there on a Twitter account and you know sound off on a piece of legislation that may be very important to the other person as a real way to solve a problem, you are creating a, a lasting impact on how they may feel about you. So that going forward, when you need that individual for assistance on something, they may hold back a little bit and, and rethink about how they want to uh, approach you and whether or not they want to support something. I'm always, there's a few elected officials that just don't have Twitter accounts. I mean, not even their offices. And that always, you know, shocks me. Uh, it's, it's amazing that, you know, in 2020, and yet, you know, they seem to be serving their constituents and getting reelected and all. So uh, maybe I need to step away from uh, from the Twitter world a little bit and, and all of that. Um, 
Speaking of stepping away a little bit, uh, I want to ask, you know, if, if you are an elected official in the state legislature or in Congress, you know, how closely do you need to follow the New York City Council or your local county legislature or even Congress? Or is it sometimes is a little bit of ignorance um, actually beneficial instead of, you know, following the, the blow by blow, having a position on every issue in a level of government that isn't yours. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? I'll jump in the top and say, it, it, you know, we're, we're, we're in a crisis right now. So I'd say very closely, uh, particularly in, 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 the, in the world we live in right now where, I mean, this is an all hands uh, on deck response at all levels of government. Um, what local public health organizations are doing on the front lines, um, you know, that's information that needs to be shared up up and down uh, the chain, uh, all the way up through the negotiations that are happening uh, in the U.S. Capitol as we speak uh, around uh, a second COVID relief package and, and the possibility of state and local aid that will then immediately flow all the way back down to those, you know, frontline health departments and workers. So, you know, in 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 a, in, a, in the crisis that we're in, it's never more important um, that we that we try to have uh, integrated government. Um, I think that's what people want. Uh, I think they see frustration when they see different levels of government um, uh, fighting with each other uh, over how best to respond to emergency situations. Um, that that's not you know that's not the expectation that we have of our elected officials, particularly uh, in a moment of crisis. Yeah, and I think from a congressional perspective, you know, in leadership meetings with Speaker Pelosi, she would often ask members about their particular districts. And so it's always helpful, for instance, when talking about state and local government to say, you know, in my district, this thing is happening and then be able to quantify that problem and really give texture to it as opposed to just sort of a bland statement saying that we need help in this district or this state. You know, it's helpful for members that have that local information where they can say specifically, these things are happening. That's why we need state and local government funding or whatever the issue may be. I, I, if I can just add, I think you also at the same time, and I think Robert's 100% correct when it comes to the particular public health crisis we're facing on COVID. I think when it comes to individual legislation, I think we there is something about respecting lanes. And I think you want to be very cognizant of, of issues. You want to be able to work collaboratively with all levels of government, whether it's from you know the federal on the federal side and your congressional members all the way down to your local mayors and your district, but I think you also want to just be very respectful um, for your colleagues who also have their own set of lines. And so I think what you want to watch out for is wading in on maybe particular issues that aren't in your district at all and getting out in front without really sitting down and understanding the how that may affect your particular district. You know, it was very easy in 2009, and this came up in the last panel discussion, we talked about the millionaire's tax, and it's very easy for folks to get out there and, and you know, scream tax the rich, tax the rich. And in 2009, you know, I was very hesitant on that particular issue. Huge financial crisis. We were facing an eight to $9 billion budget deficit after the fiscal meltdown. And I had a significant number of constituents who were potentially not just faced with that issue, but also the impact on what a millionaire's tax looked like. Because a millionaire's tax is not necessarily a millionaire's tax when you're raising it on people who make over two hundred thousand dollars a year. And I'm not, you know, trying to discount the, you know, the real possibility and impact that has. But folks going into my district and talking about that without talking to me or other elected officials. It puts a lot of pressure and it, it does not help the process. If you want to, you know, go talk to people in their, in other districts, you should really clear it and talk to other senators about that or other assembly members about that because they may have a particular point of view. And I think it's about working collaboratively because it's not just about, you know, the one-off press hit that you may get on that issue. You still have to work with other members and you still have to get legislation passed, you know, simply beyond one particular issue. And again, it comes down to working collaboratively in, in a way that's going to benefit everybody. And if you're simply just running it around the state and not thinking about where you're going, I think you're going to create more issues that you need to have as an elected official. Now, 
intergovernmental isn't just state to city, state to county, state to federal. We're also talking within the state. Uh, and of course, uh, Governor Cuomo. There's been a lot of talk about relationships between the legislature and the governor's office because of the new state Senate supermajority. Um, I wanted to open up discussion here on, you know, how should legislators deal with Cuomo in the second floor? Uh, what are the best practices for getting your issues in front of the governor, uh, you know, maintaining a good relationship if you want to maintain a good relationship? I know some, some legislators have no interest in doing so and think it's best to not have a good relationship. Um, I, Diane, I know that you've obviously worked a lot with the governor. I'll, I'll ask you first, uh, you know, what's the best way to, to deal with the office here? Well, we deal with the staff quite a bit. And I have to say, everyone, staff, and it was said before, staff and all through government are excellent. I mean, if you're a new legislator coming in, these people work hours after hours after hours and are in law books all day long. They are intelligent, smart. They've been around for a long time. Um, if you're reaching out to any of the staff members, including people in the governor's office, council's office is excellent, budget office is excellent. Um, I have always found them to be a great resource, a great um, sounding board on ideas. However, I was not a legislator. If you're a legislator, I think it's a little different. I think you may have to work through your leadership or you want to at least run issues by your leadership before you have conversations with the governor's office. I see Craig uh, saying yes, but since I was not a legislator, I am gonna pass it off to him. Oh, I was gonna throw it to Rob because he worked for the guy. <laughs> I'd rather let Rob answer that one first. He'll give the best experience. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think there's there's different aspects to it. Um, you know, certainly we are in a unique environment um, going into 2021, where you know, are we even going to be able to physically gather in person in 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 to to talk to staff to to engage with with other you know electeds, other legislators? Um, so you know, th this is in some in some regards uncharted territory as to how we actually operate a government. Um, and so, I mean, I know folks have been doing it for uh, a few months now, but it, you know, it will continue into uh, this budget cycle um, and, 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 a, and a fiscal, you know, a, 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 a big fiscal crisis. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, I could talk all, all day long about how the you know, ordinary due course of, of, of engagement, uh, but we're certainly not in ordinary times. Um, I think with anything, I mean, to Diana's point, um, you know, the, there is tremendous, uh, tremendous talent and depth um, within the, the second floor uh, uh, staff, um, as there are in on, on, on both houses of the legislature, uh, and, and a lot of relationships there. So, so for folks who are new, again, there's just, you know, there, there is real value um, and, and, and real importance in, in building that staff connectivity, uh, because a lot of just the day to day um, 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 back and forth happens at that staff level. Uh, and then obviously, um, as, as was alluded to, and, you know, and certainly Craig can talk to it in firsthand experience, you know, getting that, getting your issues up into leadership, into your, you know, into the budget process, which is critically important into your one house budget, uh, and then on into those further negotiations is, is really an art and a science all unto itself. Um, and maybe Craig, that's where I'll hand it off uh, to you to, to sort of talk about the, that, that process. Yeah, I think it's very important to to engage with lead, first with your your own leadership, whether it's on the assembly side or the senate side, on what issues are really important to you to help because they can really help bubble things up uh, up to the key people in the governor's office. But to build off of what Diane's saying, your staff and their staff, it's really important to have a great working relationship with folks in the governor's staff side of things, they are, and Rob was one of them. I mean, phenomenal folks in government and really are dedicated and work really, really long hours. You know, for the elected officials who are, you know, on the Zoom and you're gonna work long hours as well, not as long as the staff, whether it's your staff or the governor's staff. And, you know, you'll see it in the budget time that, you know, your opportunity to go back home and go to sleep at three in the morning, staff is sticking around all night. And it is important for you to engage with that staff because they can help you through that process. They will give you an, an, a valid, truthful read on how your legislation is going to do. Um, but working with leadership is just as important. You know, leadership staff will help you 
uh, through the process. I think it's important not to overwhelm and say everything's critical. Um, people will see right through that. I think you really have to pick and choose, particularly in the budget, uh, particularly in this coming budget. This is going to be a tough budget year, you know, for the advocates who are on the call today, now or in the future, or who just talked about it in the past. We are all, have all been gearing up and we know how hard it is. It's going to be a tough one. And, you know, we'll get through it like we have in all years, but now more than ever, it really comes down to working closely with the staff, being polite, understanding that they are working and going to be working really, really long hours. Um, so don't take things personal, but um, recognize that it is important to have that conversation and to stay in, stay in close communication with your leadership. You may not always agree with your leadership, but you have to understand that they're there also to ensure that you're going to be successful. So working with them is just as important. I, I do want to have a little bit of fun uh, as we discuss the the critical issue of the budget. Um, can I get some quick predictions from all of you? Are we going to have like an easy budget that comes in early this year because uh, everything might be remote and it's just going to be over email? Or am I being ridiculous and this is going to go until May or June? I don't think you're going to see anything early, um, at least coming out. I think, you know, with we're all relying on the federal government right now and trying to see what we might get out of uh, them. It's it's not gonna be a pretty budget though. I mean, how can it be? I feel like it's Rocky three when they're interviewing Mr. T as Club Lang and they ask him for his prediction and the word he uses pain. I think we're all expecting pain. I, I, I lived it. Look, 2008, in the 2009 budget, when uh, we the Democrats took the majority for the first time, and it was a very different Albany, a very different Democratic majority, a one-seat majority, um, and we had to pull together to make some very difficult budget decisions. Um, you won't have that, I think, this time around. You know, for some members who may be more what known as marginal members, who are maybe more difficult seats, but it's going to be some very tough choices. We're not going to get. Um, I think the federal relief that we were hoping for, and um, people are going to have to make some real compromise. They're going to have to breathe in. And um, if I can just, you know, maybe make up one this one pitch, when we, the four of us and others, come talk, be honest with us because we have to go back and talk to clients. It's okay to say I don't know. It's okay to say I need to think about it. It's okay to say, can you give me more data? What's not okay is to lie to us because. One, it's your reputation. Two, we have to go back to our clients, our you know people we're advocating for, and report back. And three, it's your reputation. Um, and I think that it's very important for you to take you know for you being the newly elected officials to take in everything that we're saying and to process it. And so in our conversations, um, as I like to tell my kids, don't yes me to death. Just say, I don't know. Just say, get me more information. Just say, I need to think about it. It allows us to report back to who we represent to say, assembly member so-and-so or senator so-and-so needs more information. We have to do more to convince him or her. And I think that's very important in a very difficult budget time because we, they're all, they're gonna be real world consequences for everybody in this budget. We're trying to do our best to make it easier for the people we represent and make it easier for you, but it, re it requires a lot of honesty and a lot of willingness just to be very blunt and very truthful. I would also like to say that uh, you should all be honest with journalists at all time. Uh, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> and you're gonna be overwhelmed. I to tell every new legislator, it is an overwhelming process. So you have the budget, so in everything that surrounds the budget, and then you have bills that are getting introduced. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with new legislators that said to me, I thought I was going to have time to read every bill and know everything about it. And it's just impossible. Um, you know, have good staff that can cover these and read these. And staff is really important in your office. There is, you just can't do it all. And that's okay. We don't expect everyone to know everything. That's why we're around. Um, but that's the, I think the number one thing I hear from new legislators all the time is how overwhelming the whole system is. And thankfully this year, you're not dealing with the hundreds of people walking into the hallways right. of the Capitol and knocking on your door. So, but you are gonna have Zoom meetings probably every half hour in the day with on a different topic. So, um, you know, having good staff and knowing that it's 
impossible to know everything about everything. There's just too many issues out there. Discussing meetings, I, I do see a question uh, in the Q&A that was, uh, I think I've lost the exact question, but, but it was basically about, you know, should uh, legislators be taking in-person meetings right now uh, with advocates, that sort of thing. Um, you know, do any of you have thoughts on that? Is, is uh, in-person meetings at this point or should everything be remote? With the COVID numbers the way they are right now in the state, I think remote. I mean, it's better. But to be there's no day. reason to risk anyone's health and yeah. doing anything in person doesn't have to be done that way. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I just came like I can use the presidential campaign, for example. I mean, we I mean, the Biden Harris campaign never met in person. I mean, they ran a national president, a, a, a winning national presidential campaign that was entirely virtual. Um, I'm working with transition folks now in Washington, D.C. It's entirely virtual. Um, so things are happening at the highest levels of of government and, and, and business and life and education, uh, you know, virtually now. And I think um, our elected officials at, at the state level uh, continue, continue to need to set the, the, the right public health example here and remain remote and remain virtual uh, for, the, for the time being. Another similar question there is uh, also from the Q&A. Somebody's asking uh, if in 2021, it will be more efficient for advocacy groups to seek meetings on session days or on a day where there is not session. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Hmm. I have to say, just from walking the capitals for 27 years, it's, it's, it's hard to grab a legislator's attention during session because they're off going to committee meetings, there are other meetings. And when you have a large group of people, um, and I'm talking the hundreds of people, if you really want to have an effective lobbying campaign, you need to know your issues. You need to be prepared. You need to be able to um, explain your issue in a short period of time. And I think when you have hundreds of people walking the hallway, while I know that some people, it's the effect of seeing all those people in the Capitol roaming the hallways. I mean, it is a good visual. Um, but to be effective, and especially now, I think there's going to be, I think, probably a good combination, you know, meeting people in their district offices and, you know, possibly doing some smaller lobby day at the Capitol. I just find it very hard when you have that many people in the Capitol that you're, you have the attention of everyone. I, I, Craig, you're, you being a former legislator, Curious as your thoughts. I, I always felt that if you really want to make an impact, go to the district because that's where the voters are. If you want to, if, if you want to not just meet the elected official, but also make a statement, which oftentimes happens at these, you know, lobbying events, you know, crowds are great. Like you said, Diana, with the visual, but at the same time, if I don't want, if I didn't want to be bothered, I would just slip into the Senate chamber, slip out, you know, run back, you know, go back to the LOB and I don't want to say hide, but I just didn't have to engage. I think that people were more effective at getting my attention if they went to my district office and made an appointment and then showed up with like 40 people, 50 people, nothing more, you know, th that's pretty effective when you're outside, you know, cars are driving by and I have people outside my office with signs, you know, you know, asking me to take a particular issue versus folks going up to Albany. And more often than not, the large crowd, very few would have been from my district. So I think that, you know, if, if you want to, I think, make an impact and a visual impact, doing in the district where my voters are gonna see going on versus the audience of my colleagues in Albany, I always felt it was better and more effective to be hitting me, you know, meeting me in my district and having an outreach in the district than having the outreach in Albany. I'll yeah, and the... I'm not an elected official, I've never been one, but I, my perspective in, in terms of seeing how members have dealt with that is that, you know, when you're in session, you have a million things going on. You drop in for five minutes, shake hands in an advocacy meeting and you leave, but you're not really mentally there. And I think to Craig's point, it's probably smarter to focus on a district meeting where the member is relaxed and they can be focused on listening to you and really figuring out what the issue is, as opposed to parachuting in during session when they're thinking about the next meeting they have to take after that. In fairness, Hakeem never did that. Hakeem always 
always <laughs> stayed for the very end for every single meeting. I was a little different. Much to my chagrin. <laughs> I'll say that the lunch options when you meet somebody in the district are often better than the capital Dunkin Donuts also. So that, that's another benefit for going in district. Uh, another question from the Q&A, uh, an interesting one that I hadn't thought about is, is uh, whether the pandemic has changed the attitude in New York about state preemption of local initiatives uh, and local ordinances. Um, I'll be honest, this is not my area of expertise, but that's interesting. Um, has the pandemic changed this sort of thing? Obviously, the state has been taking more control of certain things. Uh, do we have thoughts here? I mean, I'll, I'll add something. When I was in the state legislature, um, there was a big push to eliminate special districts. Um, back in 2009, 2010, there was a very vocal effort uh, to consolidate local governments um, throughout the state. And there was uh, legislation that I voted uh, for in the state legislature that would set up a mechanism uh, to make it easier and nothing really ever came from it. I think right now in the suburban areas, at least in my area in Long Island, the local government's important because they really are at the epicenter of what's going on, particularly in distributions, particularly in addressing some of the public health needs. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see that. I think that Again, like I've talked about, everyone plays a role. And I think Governor Cuomo has done an incredible job um, in, in addressing the, the pandemic. And I think he also views, at least from my point of view, the, the importance of the local government's role in making sure um, that the pandemic needs are addressed. So when you're setting up the zones, like particularly now with the, these COVID containment zones are so small that I think you actually do need to have more of a say and an importance of the local government. Well, and also with the COVID, they had the local control rooms. Yep. So I know what we did was help a lot of the a lot of industries with their reopening plans, you know, after everything was closed down. So we would work with them and then we would pitch it to the control centers, the governor's office, and really work all of the local government in with the state government so that we we're all on the same page. Obviously, everyone wants businesses to open, but we all want to do it in a safe manner. Um, I would imagine going forward now, they're all gonna be working together and the control panels probably will be activated again at some point. Um, and if you're not familiar with the control panels, the control panels had all the local um, governments and legislators on a panel, some of the key people that were reporting to the governor's office so that there was dialogue between all parties of government. Yeah, I think Diana brings up a great point. I mean, we're at this weird inflection point now where, um, you know, we had the first vaccines delivered yesterday in the state of New York, but the numbers, you know, uh, writ large are still going in a very um, troublesome direction um, and almost bringing us back to the to the late March, early April timeframe with with wider shutdowns uh, and, and more controls in place and, and reactivating a lot of the local uh, systems, uh, again, potentially uh, that Diana was referring to, while the vaccination um, um, starts to be distributed over, you know, here over the winter and the spring, and hopefully we finally turn the corner again. So it's, um, you know, it's 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 not it's not business as usual yet. Uh, it's time. It's still time to be ex extremely uh, every level of government uh, uh, reengaging uh, in the, in this in this uh, public health crisis to make sure we. Uh, you know, now that we have a vaccine, not only in sight, but in hand, um, that we can get to the end of this and, and really refocus on the economic recovery uh, that is going to be so critical uh, to the rest of the year in 2021. Uh, I mean, everybody knows um, there's a lot of pain out there uh, in, in our communities um, uh, from small business owners uh, uh, across the board. Um, uh, to to uh, there's, just, there's just a lot of work to be to, to do, a lot of rebuilding to do but we got to get over this uh, public health uh, crisis first. Two more quick hits before we run out of time. Um, I asked the question earlier a little bit wrong, it seems, in the Q&A. Um, so one, one viewer is wondering, in, given that, especially with the pandemic, that many advocacy groups are trying to have virtual meetings with legislators, uh, are legislators potentially offended if they do not get a personal meeting where it's just them and the advocates? Is it okay to have you know multiple lawmakers in on the same meeting, or uh, is it better to uh, 
you know, or do people understand that you have to be efficient and you can talk to multiple lawmakers at once here? I think it depends on which le legislators you're trying to choose. You know, if there are two chairs of committees, a lot of time committee chairs will want or committee members will want to learn about something together. Um, I was just having a conversation mm -hmm. with a legislator yesterday about Zooms and, you know, we used to be able to pass a piece of paper with information um, and go over issues with them. And can, is it, can we do that now? Can we have it come up on the screen so we can discuss, you know, discuss a topic and um, what they told me is that a lot of groups, and they have had Zoom meetings, you know, multiple Zoom meetings a day, is they will email that information a couple days in advance so that when they open the Zoom, because they're the ones controlling it, you know, they can present the data. So I think that while it um, depends on the issue and it depends on which legislators you bring into the mix, I think, I know our capital region legislators love to do that all the time. So for us, we do it quite often and we'll get everyone on a Zoom and talk about an issue. Um, I know there's other legislators in certain areas that do the same things, um, but then there's also committees if it's on a particular issue that a lot of people care about. I think it just depends on the issue, but yes, you can do that. And Which, it's not offensive to anyone, but you do have to check with their offices before you schedule it. This raises my final question. Um, you know, do you have to be friends with legislators in your overlapping district? You know, the other elected officials. Uh, is it okay to just be, you know, distant professional colleagues? Uh, I'll let anybody take that one. <laughs> I think it works best for everyone in terms of effectiveness. If you just have an honest relationship, it's okay to be transactional with certain people so long as both sides understand what it is. I don't think that people expect other members to be friends with them, but they expect um, some sort of like authenticity about the relationship and they expect clarity on what that is so that they can maneuver and do what's best for their districts. Yeah, I, I had some definite friendships when I was um, in office in the Senate, um, but it was very clear that there were times when my so-called friends said, I have to vote my particular way. I have to protect my district and I can't support your legislation. So I recognize that and I was mature enough to understand that. I think if you're mature enough to, rec to re recognize that when you're outside of the uh, Senate or the assembly chamber and voting and you can have a friendship, absolutely. But I think you, all, you really do have to bring to the table that at the end of the day, you represent your district and you can't worry about somebody's hurt feelings if that piece of legislation is gonna be detrimentally impactful to your constituency who sends you to Albany to represent their interests. They don't re send you to Albany to make friends, they send you to Albany to represent them. And I think as long as you recognize that, I think you'll be fine. Honesty and authenticity, that's the, the lesson of the day. So Craig, Michael, Diana, and Robert, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Into, into lobbying, into intergovernmental affairs, and just everything that goes on in state government. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, that was great. Um, gosh, I just wish some of these panels could keep going and going and going, especially with that last question about uh, whether people can be friends <laughs> with legislators uh, whose districts overlap with them. You know, one issue that has challenged, uh, we'll say these friendships, probably more than anything is criminal justice reform. Um, very controversial topic. Democrats have passed a lot of high profile uh, bills on this in the past two years, and they're looking to do some more um, in the upcoming session. Moderating a discussion on public safety and criminal justice now will be my colleague, Rebecca Lewis, who's gonna take things over from here. Rebecca? Thanks, Zach. Um, yeah, as, as Zach uh, so eloquently put it, uh, you know, there have been a lot of changes to criminal justice this year. There have been, there's been a lot of focus on the issue of criminal justice, criminal justice reform, police reform, uh, perhaps second only to the pandemic uh, this year. And uh, in many ways, the two go hand in hand as well. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to give um, each of our panelists today an opportunity to introduce themselves and, and talk a little bit about, you know, the topics that they want to touch on today. Uh, uh, starting with you, Senator Bailey. 
Well, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, City and State, for having me. Thank you to all of the fellow panelists. Good afternoon, everybody. Here's hoping a great holiday season for you all. I am State Senator Jamal T. Bailey, representing the 36th Senatorial District, representing the North Bronx and the Westchester City of Mount Vernon. I'm the chair of the Senate Standing Committee on Codes, and I am very proud of the work that we've done in criminal justice reform this year and police reform. Look, for so long, New York languished in terms of being progressive, in terms of doing the right thing by the people. And in the last couple of years, under the leadership of Andrea Stewart Cousins, we've been able to make glacial change in the state Senate. And that was because people came out and voted. That was, people because, that was because people saw that a Democratic majority would be able to bring better things to the state of New York. Are we done? No. The work of a legislator is never really done. As alluded to in the last panel, you are responsible to those that you represent. Those that select you are those who hold you accountable. And we are held accountable to the people. And the people, they wanted fairness in the justice system. The people were tired, sick and tired, I would say, of being trampled and having their rights trampled accordingly. So we as a legislature, we mobilized and we passed legislation that I believe will be change making in, in our state. And I, we can have further conversations about that, Rebecca, but I'm glad to be here today once again. And I'm State Senator Jamal Bailey. Thank you. Uh, Stanley. Thank you, Rebecca. Stanley Richards, Executive Vice President of the Fortune Society, Vice Chair of the Board of Corrections, and someone who lived this life of cycling in and out of jails and prisons and came to a place that helped me build a new life. And I, I just would start by saying, we're at a moment in time now where we have a lot of data, we have a lot of information, and we know mass incarceration doesn't make our community safer. It doesn't make thriving communities. It doesn't help people rebuild their lives. And we need to do something different. And we have an opportunity to do something different by one, recognizing the, the institutions, the very institutions that are supposed to protect our communities, the very institutions that are supposed to uplift our institutions that are gatekeepers. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to change that. Two, we know that mass incarceration doesn't cause, uh, create safer communities. So we need to change the way in which we manage uh, in our communities regarding safety. And three, we need to shift the investments. We need to shift the investments from punishment, isolation, and continued traumatization to reinvesting in people and in communities. Because I can tell you from the many times I went to jail and prison, each one of those cycles didn't help me rebuild my life. It wasn't until I went to school, I went to college, and I realized that the life I was living was a life I did not have to live because all the messages I received about who I am as a black, a young black man that wasn't worth anything, that didn't amount to anything, that I would end up dead or in jail were all lies. And when I realized that, I began to build a new life. And I'm telling you, we need to begin to invest in those things. And as Senator Bailey said, we've made progress, but we have a lot more to go. I'm looking forward to talking about that. Uh, DA Dorley. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandra Dorley and I'm the Monroe County District Attorney. Um, I'm in my third term as the DA here in Rochester, New York, otherwise known as I was elected in 2019 in 15, excuse me, 11, 15 and 19, but I've been a prosecutor in this office since 1992. So I know it may not be a popular thing to say, but I am a career prosecutor and I'm proud of that and I've worked my way up through the office. I also wear another hat right now as the president of the DA's Association of the State of New York. Um, otherwise known as DASNY. And what is DASNY? We are um, an organization that was founded back in 1909, but it's the organization of every single elected DA across New York State, and there are 62 of us. Our greatest function is protecting the integrity of the criminal justice system and working together with each other on new ideas, best practices, and issues that are coming up you know, before the legislature. We are again made up of every single prosecutor across the state from big urban areas to very small uh, rural areas in blue areas and in red areas. Um, we can be a great resource to legislators and we have on occasion, uh, especially when bills are an issue and you need some resources or some expertise in the criminal justice system. You know, we can give you our expertise and what we've seen transpire. We can show you or tell you what unex the unexpected consequences of some of you know, the bills may be. Um, but even though we don't see eye to eye on everything, we really wanna be a partner with each and every one of you. We wanna be at the table. 
we want to have open and honest conversations because, you know, we all feel the same way. We want as prosecutors to evolve and we want the system to work for everyone fairly and e equally. Um, over the past, we've supported legislation for the sealing of criminal convictions. You know, we've mandated the recording of um, video interviews. We've worked hard, very hard to improve identification procedures um, that, and what can be used in court. Um, and, and, and just to sum it up, we've got uh, committees that work, um, especially on different topic areas, and they could be um, a help to each and every one of you. In addition to our full legislative committee, we have a sex crimes and family violence committee. We have vehicular crimes committees, animal abuse committee, um, elder abuse, environmental crimes, mental health, ethics, and a computer crimes uh, committee. And it's made up of DAs, again, across the state who have um, specialized in these uh, particular areas. And I'd like to say that we've become experts and we are more than more than happy to help you on any piece of legislation that may come your way. So I look forward to discussing with you the many issues that we are currently dealing with across the state. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you. And thank you for the opportunity of being here today. And uh, lastly, uh, Corey. Thanks. Uh, I'm Corey Stoughton, and I'm the head attorney in charge of the Law Reform Unit at the Legal Aid Society of New York. Uh, and we um, are, are also available to consult on any criminal justice legislation you might be thinking about or looking at. Uh, we, um, we are also uh, well connected and currently chairing the State Chief Defenders Association, so really with a statewide perspective on criminal justice legislation. Uh, you know, this, this election we just saw in New York was a real mandate for further criminal justice reform. And just to echo and pick up on what Stanley said, we have, a, and, and what Senator Bailey said, we've come a long way, but we have a lot of work to do in New York. Uh, we have already, as we know, uh, been put to shame by our neighbors in New Jersey on marijuana reform. We can't let that stand, New Yorkers. Uh, we're sitting on, you know, uh, an unclaimed $1.3 billion in revenue from marijuana reform that is desperately needed in this state. And this is the year for that to really make a difference in New York, to invest that money back into impacted communities. As Stanley was saying, to shift the emphasis from law enforcement solutions to community-led, community-based uh, social welfare solutions to our underlying, those underlying problems and start to really make reparations for the damage of the war on drugs in, our, in those communities. Uh, this is also, I think, looking forward, you know, to build on the successes that Senator Bailey and his fellow senators and assembly people delivered on pretrial justice to look at the back end of the criminal justice system and parole reform, which is the single biggest driver of mass incarceration in New York. New York is one of the worst states. It is worse than in than all other states, but three, one of which is Louisiana, on reincarcerating people for, for parole violations. Uh, if you are black, you are 12 times more likely to be reincarcerated on a parole violation. And parole incarceration, parole driven incarceration costs the state over $600 million a year. And so again, we see where reform intersects with both justice and the, and the desperate budget needs that this state is facing right now. Uh, the, there are three bills on parole reform that we're really urging people to take a look at. One is called Less is More, and thank you, Senator Bailey, for your co-sponsorship of that important bill. That is the single most decarcerative bill that is pending before the New York State Legislature right now. It will restore fairness and modernize New York's parole system and really massively reduce both, both incarceration of people pending their parole violations, which more than half of people arrested on parole violations are just released back into their communities. So that is needless incarceration that costs people jobs, houses, access to their children, interrupts people's treatment regimes. That, that single bill would make a huge difference in, in, the, in, in, in New York's problem of mass incarceration. And the two other bills there are, are the elder reform bill and um, also the fair and timely reform bill, which are two other aspects of parole reform to both uh, give greater access to our elders who have been in prison for too long, generally for crimes they committed as young people who need access, better access to parole and the fair and timely bill, which would address some of the procedural deficits in the parole release process. So there's a lot of work to do. We could go on I could go on with bills, but I wanted to emphasize those because those are two that are really moving this year that are desperately needed in New York. Uh, and I think with that, we'll just kind of leave it to questions and, and the discussion. 
Well, I, I, I want to start looking backwards a little bit. Uh, there were uh, obviously unprecedented protests, not just in New York, not just in New York City, but across the state, across the country. Uh, you know, the, the some of the reforms we've seen recently came about um, basically in direct response to, you know, what people were saying, people taking to the streets, uh, making their voices heard. Looking at how, you know, these kinds of protests, they're not new. Black Lives Matter is not a new movement. Uh, police brutality is, is nothing new. But it seemed like something really changed this year. Uh, it led to uh, reform, uh, things that have been pending for some time now. And I just want to, you know, throw it out to each of you, you know, looking at what has happened over the summer and what's continued to happen since, what has changed in the conversation, in the landscape? that you know especially new lawmakers should be aware of as they're coming into uh the new session and thinking about the different ways that they can address the issues before them yeah i'll i'll, I'll start <laughs> I, I think i think part of what has shifted is that there is agreement across this country an acknowledgement that black and brown people as it relates to the criminal justice system and as it relates to some of our institutions that are supposed to protect communities and uplift communities have been institutions that have been built on the racism and the way that this country was started with slavery. And it's been a continuation of that. And while we've tinkered around the edges in those institutions to make them more fairer, accountable, equitable, and transparent, we haven't done the deep dive work that we need to do to reform those institutions. And people are tired of being the subject of those kind of institutional racism. And mass incarceration is the clearest thing that you can grab and, and identify and say, we need to begin to change here. But it goes beyond that. It goes into our education system. It goes into our housing system. It goes into all aspects of the lives in the most hardest hit uh, communities. You know, FWPA did uh, a study on poverty and the criminalization of poverty. And there's a there's a, a map that clearly shows the overlap in the communities in New York City. Mass incarceration, poverty, homelessness, mental illness, everything you, you could combine in a society is overlaid in those very communities. And that's not by accident, but we need to do something about it. Oh, I, would, I would just say that from the legislative perspective, this is something that was, you know, thought of quite some time ago. If you're talking about 50A and the police reform, uh, yes, we passed them this year, but the genesis for those bills took place long ago, long before I even was elected with people like Velma Nutt Montgomery, uh, legends in, in, in our justice system who have stood up for justice for so long. And if we're looking at who's really brought, it to, brought us to this moment, it's the mothers of the movement. It, it is the Gwen Cars and the Constance Malcolms and the Valerie Bells. Those mothers who came time and time again because, of, because they were aggrieved, time and time again because they were denied justice, time and time again they came back in time, right? They were the ones who censored us. But as legislators, we have a job to do as well. And that's making sure that not just as an attorney, but as a legislator, you prove your case. So we held hearings on 58 last October. Uh, one in Albany, one in the city of New York. And what I pride myself on is I want to hear from everyone, whether I agree with you or not. I, I want to hear with you, hear what you have to say so that we can shape policy for what's best for the people of the state of New York. And that's what we did. My fellow legislators and I, we, we, we held hearings and when the time was right. And the time was right because of eight minutes and 46 seconds of pain on the collective neck of Black America that we saw in Minneapolis. People took to the streets after that because it was visually, we saw it. We were home because of the pandemic. We had no choice, we couldn't move. We saw it right in front of us. This was indisputable. And we saw what happened. And people who quite frankly may not have been able to comprehend, not comprehend in a literal sense, but comprehend from their worldview that such things were happening, they saw it. And they saw it for over eight minutes and 46 seconds. I think things like that helped to contextualize what, as Stanley was saying, the struggle has been in black and brown America as related to the justice system. Contrary to popular belief, we don't hate law enforcement. We wanna be protected just like everybody else. But when you see something like that, so egregious, we had to act. And my colleagues in the legislature under our great leadership, 
We certainly did. And if I could just follow up on that, because I was going to say, you know what, peaceful protests are, you know, um, we see it as an opportunity for change. And, you know, there's so many advocates kids for change in this community. And I think it's unfair to suggest that law enforcement is not adverse to change because you know what they, they want to change too. Just as us prosecutors, we see ourselves as evolving in the social justice realm and in this in this state in particular, law enforcement sees the same thing too. And you know what, I, I commend the legislature for all of the, the police reform bills that were passed in the spring of 2020 starting off with the repeal of 50, 50A, because it is bringing transparency to the community. So we're now able to, you know, have a better handle on what our law enforcement is doing. And again, law enforcement wants to change. They want to better be able to take positive steps to foster change in the community and protect the people that they are committed to serve. So these are all positive steps. And I know with, you know, all of the new uh, modifications that are coming to light, you know, in addition to the anti-chokehold legislation, the creation of the Office of Special Investigation, and then even the creation of the Office of the Law Enforcement Misconduct um, Office. These are all, you know, positive steps forward to, again, create transparency. And, uh, and I see it, and I know my fellow DAs see it as a way to reinstate the integrity of law enforcement throughout the state. So thank you. And, and I would just like to add, I, thank you for saying that, because we need as a society to be able to speak truth to our, the way our systems without people feeling that we're demonizing them or there's a right way and a wrong way. And I think we got to have a conversation, as you said, this is not about bad police. This is not about bad DAs. This is not about bad versus good. But this is the truth that we experience. And we need to be able to speak that truth without feeling that people are taking sides on it. And we're in a situation right now in New York City where our commissioner is just laying out falsehoods about bail reform and all the rest of that stuff. And that's about mm -hmm. the demonization of the people that we're talking about uplifting, changing systems and changing institutions. And we can't do that when we have our leaders demonizing and we got to change that. So thank you for saying uh, that we need to work together. And as Senator Bailey said about hating police not liking DAs or bad or good. This is about the way people experience it and the way we address it, speak through it. Now, since you brought up bail reform, that is uh, a, a topic obviously that we uh, can not just not talk about. It was something that was passed, but it continues to be a topic of conversation. You know, what, what are the conversations that must still be had about bail reform? Uh, as you mentioned, Stanley, it is something that New York City's police commissioner uh, continues to uh, associate with a rise in violent crime. Uh, it is something that uh, you, you might see uh, in some tabloids an association between uh, certain crimes and bail reform. You know, how do those conversations happen, continue to happen to ensure that there is equity in the criminal justice that something like you know bail reform which was a major milestone for the state when it passed you know can continue to be effective while assuaging fears that people might have whether it's from legitimate fears about rising crime or misinformation because they don't understand the the ultimate purpose of of what these reforms are meant to be yeah, I mean, if I could just jump in on that, I, I think we need to be very, very clear about the facts. And the facts are that while there is an increase in violent crime, in especially in New York City, there, the link between that and bail reform has been definitively debunked by, of all places, the New York Post, which you know did FOIA requests to the city of New York, the mayor's office of criminal justice, and the NYPD, and got the data and pressed the police department as only the Post can on the linkage that the commissioner keeps drawing between these two issues and found nothing. And Gothamist and New York One followed up with a survey on that that again verified that looking at the data showing absolutely no link. 
there were 1,500 people released from Rikers Island by, through a combination of the bail reform and the pandemic releases. Only 13% of them were rearrested, and those rearrests were at lower rates for violent crime than the general arrest population. So there's, and, and, and none, none of the gun violence that we've seen in the city is linked to bail reform. So yes, there's something going on, and, and it needs, it desperately needs a solution, but this desperate attempt to link bail reform to that issue is really a losing battle because you know I, I continue to be an optimist and maybe a maybe a Pollyanna about the value of reason, but there is really no truth to it. And so and and I think the voters saw that because there were millions, tens of millions of dollars poured into this election cycle by those same forces trying to establish that link and get a mandate to roll back bail reform by targeting particular senators that were perceived to be vulnerable and targeting them with messages about a soft on crime and oh my gosh, they rolled back bail reform and isn't it so dangerous? And guess what? There's a super majority in the legislature. It was a complete and utter failure of that strategy. And I think these people saw through it and saw the facts. So I think we need to look forward and realize that that's a failed effort, that we that bail reform is a success story. Uh, I wish it hadn't had the small rollbacks that happened last year. I think that was a faltering by some of our leader, our, our, you know, of, our, of our, gov our governor and our state leadership. But I think we've learned the lesson that that's not necessary. We need to plow ahead and continue to tackle the drivers of mass incarceration and racial injustice and fundamental justice in our criminal justice system. And, and that is absolutely true in every aspect of our criminal justice system around parole violations, around reoffenses, around incarceration, who needs to be detained versus who can uh, be relied upon to come back to court based on our system. That is the basis for how we should move forward based on the facts, not based on scare tactics and throw enough stuff on the wall, some stuff will stick and, and we can move forward. Like, And, you know, and if, and I, if I could just. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator. Go ahead. No, and just just to add, look, the, the reality is that I, I think that the reason why we did that is if you look at the bottom line, of what the purpose of bail is, right? The intention of bail is to is to ensure what, that one returns to court. Now, we we've all heard the name Khalif Browder one too many times, but that is something to underline about wealth based detention and how much of a scourge that is in our society. You should not be incarcerated solely based upon the amount of money that you either have or do not have. I think bail reform goes a long way in ensuring that we in, in ensuring that we begin as again the beginning of the of the re reformation of our justice system, because again incarcerating people for crimes simply because they don't have the money to get out may be even worse than the than, than some of the crimes that they are that, that they are purported to have committed. So you know I, I think that's one of the the main reasons that that we um that, that we that we did that and I'm and, I, and again statistical data doesn't show anything one way or another because based upon this pandemic the the the, the spikes we don't we don't know we don't know what's happening we don't know what's happening so it, it's it's really unfair to point as bear, to bear reform as a cause for an increase in crime rates i, I think that's a correlation that's way too far and I, I was just going to add on two points. I, I think it really is too it, premature to determine um, the effects of the criminal justice reform because, you know, not as soon as it started, you know, we were hit in the midst of a global pandemic, and it's it's very difficult uh, uh, to assess. I think only time will tell in that respect. But what I would urge um, you, the legislature, to do is we really need more funding for pretrial services if we want to assist people who are out of custody awaiting disposition of their matters. We want to be able to give them the proper guidance that they need, whether it even be, you know, setting them up with mental health treatment or drug and alcohol treatment right at the get-go when they get into, into the system. And if we could have a more robust pretrial services in every single county, that would help tremendously. And, you know, it, they would also be and, you know, able to be responsible for ensuring that people come back to court. And if any money is directed at this point, I think that would be the most useful in a prosecutor's opinion. You know, just thinking about, uh, as, as the point was made, that you had so many uh, law enforcement uh, organizations pouring money into uh, elections, supporting candidates, most of whom did not win running on a, a platform of rolling back bail reform, of instituting law and order. How moving forward can these conversations be had between 
law enforcement who have have you know shown that there is some reticence at the very least to some of the proposed and enacted reforms uh because obviously a, a bringing about a, a a more equitable criminal justice system would be uh, a much easier task if all people involved can come to the table and you know come to agreements on how to fix it how can those conversations happen how are those pathways opened for lawmakers coming in you know especially if in their race uh the law enforcement in their communities spent heavily against them I think there, it was something that was alluded to in the last panel. Uh, you know, it was, you have to do what's best for your constituency, right? And so my job as a state senator is to make sure that I'm listening to all issues. Now, do again, do I have to personally agree with everything that you say? Absolutely not. Is it my job to listen to you? It is. And, and, I, and I think that's something that, I, again, I pride myself on. You know, it, you have to be able to listen to people who you have um, different, a difference of opinion from. You have to be able to do that because you're gonna be able to find some common ground. Now, what that common ground is may not be on the subject matter legislation. It may be because you like the same sports team, but find that damn common ground and move from there. Because at the end of the day, we're gonna to have to figure out how to work together on something, right? How do we work together on something? By finding whatever scintilla of evidence, as they said in law school, would be there to find that common ground and then build up from that. Um, will it be hard maybe for, for, for some, I don't wanna just say law enforcement, right? But, but for some people who have, um, who have villainized individually, individuals, that may be difficult, right? Because you saying that that you that you um, don't like what I did versus such and such person is a terrible person, those are two different bridges. So it, I, I think it depends on the tenor of what the attack ads were on some of my colleagues in government. Um, but look, we all have a job to do. And I think that um, I, 43 strong in the, in the, in the state Senate, um, Democratic majority, I think that we've shown that we know how to work together under the leadership of Andrew Stewart Cousins. We're gonna to continue to do that. Yeah, I just add, you know, we do have some common ground on criminal justice. Not everything is so contentious. And one, you know, I mean, I, I'm going to bang on about pro reform as much as you let me. But one of the, I just have to kind of resist because it's a great example. Because I would, and I wish I'd get, gotten most up to date statistics on this before this panel, and I didn't. But but I'm sure on the Less Is More website, if you Google it, you could find that the coalition behind that legislation has done a remarkable job of getting the support of law enforcement around the state. There are numerous sheriff's departments and police departments and even district attorneys who have thrown their support behind that legislative package on parole reform because it's really just widely recognized that New York parole reform parole system is is really broken and and needs updating and that that legislation really represents a consensus view where there is common ground on a, a, a reform that will both be you know be better for impacted communities reduce incarceration but also just make the system work much better and, and thank you uh, for that, Corey. I think we, that is what you propose um, is actionable and we can do that. Our state legislatures can do that uh, and make that change. It'll be a big change. But I wanna, I wanna talk about the police reform. I think we need to uh, stop, as I said earlier, demonizing each other and begin to really listen to each other. One of the things we were uh, doing at the Fortune Society before the pandemic we have reached out to one police plaza. We serve alternatives to incarceration. We serve reentry folks. We serve homeless. We serve anybody with a criminal justice history. And one of the things we wanted to do was to start a dialogue between one police plaza and some of our participants that come from the hardest hit communities. And it was almost like going to be a listening tour where they could hear how our folks experience policing in their communities and then take that information, not to say that they would be demonizing them, but to take that information and say, how, hey, how can we respond differently? How can we have partnerships? Because as Senator said, nobody wants communities that don't have policing, but we want policing that's fair. We want policing that's transparent, policing that is built on partnerships and not a demonization of the people you be protected not abuse of the people you're supposed to protection. And when those things happen, we expect our law enforcement to step up and stand up and say that is unacceptable because that's not what our SHIELD stands for. That's not what our oath stands for. But we're not there yet, but it starts with communication. You know, and, and DA Dorley, I, I'm curious to hear from you about you know the role that 
prosecutors can play in this. Uh, you know, it's down downstate in New York City, uh, in the Manhattan District Attorney's race. So you hear you have a lot of candidates who are running, uh, you know, very progressive uh, campaigns on decarceration, alternatives to jail, alternatives to prison, trying to reduce prison populations. And then, you know, it seems like there is a lot of power that prosecutors can have even without, you know, direct legislative reform in, in their discretion and how they uh, treat the people who come through the criminal justice system. So, you know, what, what role do, the, do, do you feel that the, the DAs like yourself and the DAs represented by DASNY have here in, in this ongoing conversation? Yeah, and, and it's really important to note that, you know, according to the Division of Criminal Justice Services over the past seven years, New York State has reduced its prison population by 21%. And we are one of the lowest, um, one of the largest states with the lowest incarceration rate. So I think it means that we're, we're moving in the right direction and we're, we're doing the right things. We're making smarter choices as to who is to be incarcerated and who is to be, you know, out at large and working um, in, in dealing with other issues. Um, but most of our, our DA's offices, we are huge proponents of, of diversion courts. Um, we want to make sure that people, you know, don't come into the criminal justice. We want to use um, different types of diversion that could either be, you know, involve the court system or those that actually involve law enforcement. There are so many programs that, you know, many of us are doing um, under something called Project LEAD, which is law enforcement affected uh, diversion, where it's actually the officer that diverts someone post arrest, pre arraignment, and that case never comes into the system. We're working on restorative justice principles. We wish we had more funding on that as well. Funding, funding. Um, but you know, an, another thing that we're doing is we're looking at the data. We're, we're for the first time in, in forever, you know, looking at, you know, what our offices are doing individually and looking at the data. And we want to take that data and again, make smarter choices and create transparency for our communities because our community deserves to know what we are doing in each particular case. And many of us are working with different types of entities. I myself, I'm working with Amy Bach of Measures for Justice to create a, a portal where anyone in my community can get online and see exactly what we're doing in our community. So there's so many ways that we are trying to improve this perception or improve, I don't wanna say perception, but improve mass incarceration. And again, with the numbers in New York, we're really, we're, we're chipping away at it and we're trying to do you know, a better job. We wanna make sure that you know, we are, like I said in my opening, that we are making sure that justice is being served for everyone in our community. And I, I would just like to add, and thank you for that, uh, DA Dooley. Um, the John Jay College Institute for Innovation and Prosecution has set out a number of reports and working with DAs around the country to really recognize, as the DA was just saying, their role in the criminal justice system and the the influence and authority they have at the charging point about who goes in and who doesn't go in. And I'm glad to hear uh, the DA talk about that work. That is so critically important. And I would encourage DAs to really take a look at some of those recommendations because part of ending mass incarceration is looking at the front door. And the front door is at policing and the front door is at just uh, uh, charging. You know, shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, looking forward to next year, obviously, uh, Corey has mentioned parole reform a couple times, uh, but I think that one of, obviously, one of the biggest issue, issues um, that's coming up uh, that she also mentioned, uh, the potentially the legalization of marijuana for, for recreational purposes for adults, uh, something that uh, has, for the past couple of years, uh, failed to come to full fruition. Uh, as reporters like myself uh, furiously tried to track down every single vote to figure out how far away uh, the legislature was from potentially passing it. And it seems like every year it comes down to money, what to do with the money. And uh, lots of different people wanna do lots of different things, uh, ranging from investing in the communities that have been hurt by the war on drugs historically and investing in uh, people who have been hurt uh, investing in uh, people in those communities so that they can actually own businesses in the new legal market, 
Uh, and then there are, uh, you know, I know the, the, the governor has often tried to keep things a little bit more flexible. And there are obviously uh, law enforcement interests who feel that they should get some of that funding to deal with the new problems that may arise, like stone driving and, you know, public safety with uh, make sure it stays out of the hands of kids and things like that. You know, what is the conversation like what looking into 2021? What is the landscape right now? What are the conversations that should be had around this, especially now that New Jersey has uh, beat us to it through their ballot referendum? And it seems more likely than ever that some sort of compromise will happen this year and that it will pass. Uh, and Senator Bailey, I, I suppose start with you because you've been, you've been in the legislature and in, in part of these conversations. So look, I, I'm a co-sponsor of legislation. I believe that we should legalize adult use cannabis, but like we have to look at some of the, the, the systematic changes that we need to make sure that it's going to be successful, right? So a couple of years back, we were able to pass the, the decriminalization of, of, of marijuana and the expungement of the records, right? Which was a, which was a first step, right? That piece of legislation that I, that I sponsored was a first step in turning, helping to turn some lives around who were, who were who were irreparably harmed because of the possession of a of a plant that had been effectively legal in other communities, depending on enforcement. And they were and, and like the enforcement things. There's so much data on that about marijuana arrests in certain black and brown communities versus non-black and brown communities. So that was the first step. Now the real step, as you said, Rebecca, is going to be the actual reinvestment in the community. Right? Who the, who were those who were most adversely affected by this failed war on drugs? Right? That. The money should go back to these folks, right? And not just to the communities at large, just so to speak, but in, in actual businesses. Um, we're, I'm a big proponent of also worker cooperatives, worker-owned businesses, and it's something that should, without a doubt, be in our version, in New York's version of whatever legalization structure that we pass. Because, you know, you deserve to be an owner, you deserve to be a worker, and you deserve to be able to combine those two to be able to help your community. And again, other states, our neighboring states, whether it's Massachusetts to the right of us in upstate New York or New Jersey to the left, left of us and further south in, in, New York, in, our, in New York City, look, they, they are moving on this faster than we are. And we should be able to regain the market share so that it, so that it should stay. Should there be money for, um, for, for law enforcement? Of course. Should there be money for other? I, of course, there should be money elsewhere. But the bulk of the money should go back into the communities that were, that, that, that were harmed by it. And those are those are two things, two important points that I think you know prosecutors would support. You know, we do want the money to go back into the communities, and we want public safety to be at the table when you're drafting this legislation. We want to make sure that we could still protect those who drive on our roadways from impaired drivers. So that's going to be a priority to us, whether it be the investment in additional drug recognition experts or improving some kind of technology to detect the impaired driver. But uh, you know, our biggest concern here is making the roadways safe for the members of the community because many of us have decriminalized um, marijuana before the legislature even did. You know, A lot of us don't prosecute low level marijuana offenses anymore and we haven't for years. But we just wanna make sure that as we're going forward that the public safety aspect is definitely um, on the minds of everyone and especially, you know, um, we, we don't want it in the hands of our children. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would just want to add to that, you know, the, just to underscore the, the importance of ensuring that when we do this, which I firmly believe that New York will, that we do it right. And, and, and it goes back to Rebecca, to what you said earlier about like, what's different now? What moment are we in? And when we have you know, an uprising this summer of black and brown communities and their allies and other communities taking to the streets to recognize the longstanding impacts of systemic racism. And when we think about, I think as Stanley, I can't remember, was saying, you know, the overlapping problems with COVID that these same communities are experiencing compounding problems of economic disadvantage, high rates of COVID infection, and, uh, and, and, and we and and over policing; those are the same communities. And the the MRTA bill, which is the particular bill that I think it's really important legislators take a look at as the right model for the decriminalization and legalization regulation of marijuana, would ensure that 50% of that 1.3 billion dollars is invested back into those communities in the form of investments in health and education 
It also ensures that some of the revenue goes into drug treatment and, uh, and, and diversion programs to ensure that there aren't any of those collateral consequences from legalization. And it has controls in it, uh, market controls, to make sure that we don't make the mistakes of the early adopters of marijuana legislation, where we saw monopolies come in and some small number of people make extraordinary sums of money on the marijuana trade, rather than, as Senator Bailey was talking about, ensuring that those economic windfalls are evenly distributed and that everyone in our communities has fair access to that same kind of business opportunity. So it, you know, the moment we are in right now, it would be a travesty not to ensure that we take this extraordinary opportunity presented by the revenue created by this just and necessary measure and invest it back into those communities. And I, I agree with you 100%, Corey. And I think all of the bills that Corey talked about and the steps are steps that our legislators can take uh, to communicate to the communities most impacted that we hear you, we see you, and we're taking action. And we're in a moment where we need to take action. I, I, looking at, you know, this is that, and as, as Corey said, uh, role reform, two major issues that are expected to come up this, this, this session. Um, uh, we we will be wrapping up soon, so I think the the the, the last thing that I want to leave there are so many other things that we could talk about. Forty five minutes is not nearly enough time uh, to talk about everything that we could or should be talking about on this issue. Um, but for each of you, I'd like to just ask, you know, what what is what's flying below the radar right now? What are issues that you think are not getting enough attention that is not you know being talked about by as, as things that the legislature should address next year, you know, what, what, are, what are we not talking about that you think we should be talking about right now that lawmakers entering session next year should have on their minds? I'll start, there, there's two things that uh, Fortune is, is focusing on uh, that we need to do. And it starts with what Senator Bailey started off with about how do we get to this, how did we get to this moment and he talked about we were all in sheltering in place and we saw eight minutes and 45 seconds, 46 seconds of what happened uh, to a, a black person. We don't have that same access in our jails and in our prisons. And we have been advocating for uh, body cameras in our institutions that have for far too long been out of sight, out of mind, and with little accountability. And that is something that we can do, we can do swiftly. We've seen the impact of the images that have happened to people on the street and how it mobilized people and demanded change. And I think we need to do that for our institutions. We need to bring them out of the shadows and bring them into the light. The second thing is we need to really be looking at, and this is what the DA was talking about, how people are coming home in New York State the amount of people who are released on parole that end up in our shelters is appalling. And we need to do something about that. It, that doesn't have to be. The amount of money we invest in incarcerating people by reducing incarceration and reinvesting those monies and changing our local and state laws about how people come home can make a huge difference. So I would encourage our legislators to take on two additional opportunities in addition to what Corey said camera, a body camera bill, and how people come home when they're homeless. Okay, well, I have so many, but I won't dominate this. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'll We've just be really just a couple quick minutes, as well. So first, I'll just say, you know, we, the, all the defender organizations are working on a letter. It is way too long. We're identifying all kinds of legislation we think should be passed. So have a look, keep a lookout for our letter that's coming and I'll leave it at that. But let me just highlight three quick, very, very quick issues. One is uh, limiting and restricting solitary confinement. There's a bill called Halt Solitary that's pending legislature. This is also a bill that would end up saving money because it turns out that isolated confinement is quite expensive. It also doesn't work. Uh, there's incredible studies behind this. Uh, the uh, a use and abuse of solitary and isolated confinement in state prison facilities is abomination. Please take a look at that bill. The second thing I just want to mention is expungement. Senator Bailey talked about how we've made really important strides in expanding uh, criminal record expungement. The problem right now is it's not automatic. 
uh, and I will just tell you at Legal Aid, we spend an enormous amount of resource, lawyer resources trying to help community members go through the Byzantine application process to get their criminal records expunged. We need to make it automatic. And there's a bill that Senator Myrie is working on that will make it automatic and will just reduce bureaucracy and deliver those benefits directly back into communities to help remove those barriers that criminal records represent, represent to people getting their lives back on track and reintegrating back into communities. And there's so much more, but I'm just going to leave it there. So oh, go ahead. <laughs> after you, Madam DA, I went first last time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll be really quick too. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on reentry bills, absolutely. I sit on, you know, something locally here in Rochester. We need to make sure that when people get out of um, state prison that they have jobs and they have homes um, more likely to not reoffend if those provisions are set up for them. So I think that is important. And then selfishly, you know what, as I said, the prosecutor, we are ever evolving. We need additional funds. There was a discovery compensation fund that was set up for $40 million to assist us in getting discovery to the defense bar as soon as possible. And it is being repealed in uh, the end of March in 2021, 22. So we would need that funding to be continued. And again, um, criminal justice reform, pretrial services funding, again, crucial for us to make sure that all of the work that you've all done with criminal justice reform is able to be carried out in the most efficient and safest way for everyone in New York State. Thank you so much. So and unfortunately, Senator, I'm, I'm so sorry I've gotten the cue that we got to cut off, but uh, hopefully uh, your new colleagues will be able to talk to you personally about uh, issues that you think that they should be paying attention to. Uh, I think it's good that we heard from uh, some of from DA Dorley and some of the advocates who they perhaps won't see. Hopefully, once everything is back to some semblance of normalcy, where you might see them in the hallway. Well, I think that's my cue to pick up the audio cut out for just a second. So sorry we couldn't get in the senator's uh, last comment there, but great discussion. Uh, criminal justice reforms is one of the most exciting things happening in the legislature right now, whether you're for or against them, maybe. Um, but we're going to move on to our next panel, which is on another big topic in state government, maybe the biggest of all, education and funding for public schools. Now, we're getting a little bit of uh, extra editorial help in here. We're bringing in a ringer, one of the best known names in state journalism, one of the most uh, knowledgeable reporters out there. Capital tonight, Susan Arbetter, who's going to lead a great discussion on education policy. Zach, you are very kind and very generous. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome to City and State's education panel for new members. This should be pretty exciting. We have three top-notch people joining us. Um, first, we have uh, Jasmine Gripper, who's the executive director of the Alliance for Quality Education. We have Paula White, who's the executive director of e for e New York. And Robert Lowry, the Deputy Director for Advocacy and Communication for the New York State Council of School Superintendents. The lore in Albany is that there are about five people who really understand the, uh, the, the education budget and the foundation aid formula. And these are the people that, that, that understand it. So we should have a good, a good program. Under the education umbrella, the, the state has two opposing realities that it has to deal with. The first is its constitutional obligation to provide a sound basic education to all students. The second reality is a lack of money due to the COVID recession. So the question is, how will state ed and the regents uh, handle these two issues within the confines of the state budget while districts continue to implement both remote and in-person learning? And how are all of these issues affecting the achievement gap, which is a longstanding issue in New York? With that as our starting point, I thought that we would ask our three uh, panelists, starting with Jasmine, to briefly list what their top concerns are as we head into the session. Jasmine. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, so you laid out the problem, right? Their school districts have a lot to do and they don't have a lot of resources or money to do it. Um, and this has been a persistent problem in New York State. The underfunding or the systemic underfunding of our public schools, predominantly schools in black, brown and low income communities. The campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit was won over a decade ago. New York State has a foundation aid formula to distribute money equitably and we have yet to fully fund that formula. Right now our schools are owed 
about $4 billion in order to meet that bare minimum constitutional obligation. Um, and so we need to reach that bare minimum constitutional obligation of adequate and fair funding for our schools. And COVID has been devastating and laying to bear the inequities that always existed and are now exasperated by this pandemic. Um, and school districts were not giving any additional resources to meet the growing demands at this time. They had to spend more money on personal protective equipment and cleaning. They had to spend more money on transportation and some districts use their buses to provide school uh, lunches to kids while they were home. Um, and they had to use money to ramp up and buy technology. Uh, we as a state are failing our children. We still do not have a one-to-one -one student to device ratio. And if learning is happening online, anything less than a one-to-one -one ratio means that we are denying children access to a free public education. And we need to do that quickly. And then the last thing I'll touch on is the pandemic adjustment cut. Uh, in the 2020 enacted budget, Governor Cuomo cut 20, uh, cut $1.1 billion from public education, a uh, majority of that from high need schools. You can go to the AQE website and literally look up by district, how much every district is owed in that pandemic cut. Uh, New York City, for example, lost $700 million. Um, New York State, the legislature and the governor have talked about how they plan on closing that gap. Um, and we, can't not, we cannot go into 2021 budget negotiations uh, with a billion dollar hole in education. We have to support our schools and budgets are about priorities. The state will always cry broke, but we live in the richest country in the world. We live in one of the richest states, but it's about priorities. It's time to tax the ultra wealthy so that we can fully fund our schools. Paula, how about you? Sure, good afternoon, Susan, and so glad to be here and to have this important conversation and happy holidays to all for those who are celebrating and will momentarily. Um, you know, Ron Edmonds, um, an educator, a veteran educator said that we can, whenever we choose, educate all students, all children whose schooling is of interest to us. And whether or not we have done that depends on how we feel about the fact that we haven't done it so far. And I think that COVID is really just um, putting in neon lights how we feel about the fact that we haven't educated all of the students that we need to educate so far. And so I would echo much of what um, Ms. Gripper just stated around um, you know, the various sources of funding and the strains on budgets that frankly cannot be alleviated, right? It is not an option to not deliver meals to children, at least certainly not in my book and I don't think in most other folks as well. And so that is of utmost importance. I think we also have to think about sort of, you know, equity, right? Always looking through the lens of equity, because what that means is that then we will do away with the notion that everybody has to get the same thing. Because an equitable approach really says that depending on the need of the student, of the community, you know, of the state, in fact, then that is what really is the arbiter of what happens. I think digital equity is huge. Um, you know, and when I was in the classroom 20 years ago, you know, I was sending home, uh, you know, digital devices for students to do homework on through a pilot program. You know, we're talking 20 years ago. The notion of one-to-one -one devices is not new. It's actually quite old. And, you know, we should have already had this sort of um, infrastructure in place in order to make sure that, you know, certainly we didn't anticipate a pandemic was going to happen in 2020. I get that. But had we had some of these things in place that should have all, always been there, then that transition would have been more seamless. But we certainly cannot expect that students are going to be educated. And we know, we know that students are not all experiencing the same uh, circumstances. We know that 114,000 students in New York City alone are experiencing homelessness. And so if you don't have a permanent place to live, it is fair to assume that you will also not necessarily have access to uh, Wi-Fi as well as to devices. So these are just some of the things that we've got to really pay attention to in this moment. Bob Lowry, how about you? Your top three concerns. Uh, well, first, thank you very much for uh, for this opportunity. And you know, my honest answer would be funding, funding, and funding. Uh, it's hard to know what to advocate for next year because the current year remains so unsettled. Since the governor signed the budget into law back uh, in early April, uh, he's warned that if we do not receive more assistance from Washington, it will be necessary to cut uh, local assistance, including school aid, by up to 20 percent. So our message to uh, to the congressional delegation has made three points. One, states need fiscal relief. 
Two, schools need help to, to meet some of the exceptional costs that they've had to manage uh, to in, in order to uh, open and operate safely in this, uh, this climate. And, uh, and third, we need more than a single year of, uh, of assistance from Washington, just as in the aftermath of the Great Recession, the financial system collapsed about 10 years ago, there was more than a single year of federal aid provided. Uh, the budget division is required by law to do quarterly updates on the state's financial outlook. They're truly impressive documents, and they forecast that for next year, the state would have a structural deficit of over $8 billion, and that's assuming that if we didn't get federal aid, we would have made $8 billion worth of recurring cuts. So that means if we don't get recurring help or don't make those cuts this year, we'd have a structural deficit of $16 billion for next year, and that's about... 15% of our projected expenditures. That to me is a horrific prospect. So trying to avert mid-year cuts this year and get the best budget possible for next year are the overwhelming priorities. So why don't we start with the regents um, suggested uh, budget request uh, or their budget request. It's not suggested, it is their budget request. They released it yesterday. It's very complicated. Bob, what can you tell us about it and what your thoughts are on it? Well, what they have said is uh, that essentially that the state should uh, uh, fund existing formulas for like transportation aid, BOCES aid, building aid, special education, according to current law formulas. And those would generate increases and decreases for, uh, for individual districts. In the aggregate, there'd be a, a statewide increase. They would freeze foundation aid, and they would say that uh, you know the pandemic adjustment that uh, Jasmine referred to uh, that should be repaid to districts over uh, two years. Uh, the bottom line is exclusive of those increases in the so-called expense-based aids, uh, school aid would be level funded. And uh, now that's just not adequate for the challenges that schools face. We have the usual costs uh, with rising health insurance, pension costs and so forth, and truly exceptional costs around reopening safely. Right. You know, uh, the additional cost of trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, socially distance within the schools, uh, purchase uh, PPE, uh, clean the schools, uh, address student mental health uh, concerns and so forth. So it's not just that our revenues are more uncertain and constrained than in the past, but we also have these exceptional costs. So Jasmine, the, the CARES Act funding that uh, sort of replaced that swept, swept in there and replaced the money that the governor removed and that the legislature removed um, is gonna be replaced now over two years. It's $1.1 billion. Um, how should that be replaced? I think when it was um, doled out, it was just sort of given out equally, wasn't it? With no equity in mind. No, I would say the CARES Act money actually was uh, had some sense of equity. It was based on Title I dollars from the federal government. So they were driving the dollars to the districts that needed it the most. I will say I was a bit disappointed by the, the region's proposal. It was a bit more conservative than they typically put forward, um, as, as opposed to really being grounded in what students need. This, this proposal is not going to get us to meeting the adequate needs of students. Uh, the CARES Act money... Um, and paying back the pandemic adjustment cut over two years is going to mean cuts to districts. We already saw cuts this year, Albany, Schenectady, Rochester, um, even in Long Island, districts started making cuts. When you don't give school districts any increase and their costs go up, it means that they have to cut services and programs. And at a time where kids need more and not less, we should not allow cuts to happen. And so the I think just piggybacking what Bob said is like this is inadequate to get us to really what we need. We need to fully repay the pandemic adjustment immediately in one year. We need to not freeze foundation aid, but fully fund it. Um, and we need to also ask the federal government to kick in um, and do their share for New York State, primarily for our K-12 education system. Do you think, Paula, that it's time to raise taxes immediately? Carl Hasty, who's the speaker, said yesterday that he might consider bringing lawmakers back in order to enact a, a tax hike. You know, the reality is that there are um, proportionately lots of people that are not paying the share that uh, folks in my income bracket um, and, 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 and others are not paying, right? And that's a delicate, uh, you know, as I can put it. So I- That was diplomatic. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, you know, definitely think that this is something worthy of some very serious exploration because the reality of the situation is that we are cash strapped in this moment. And, you know, what we have been advocating for, we've been advocating at all levels. We've been advocating at the federal level for, you know, additional stimulus funds to come to education. And then we're also having to advocate here, you know, at the state level. But then, you know, we also need to be thinking about at the district level as well. We need to be thinking about levels of accountability because quite frankly, uh, you know, we, we have to inelegantly state that even when um, money goes down to districts, we have to make sure that that money is being disseminated to make sure that the things that we're saying we need, that when the, but that when the dollars actually do come in, to the state, to the district's bank account, that it's going to those places. Because the fact that we have, that we came into the pandemic with lots of things awry means that we weren't always, you know, using funds as judiciously as we should have been. And I think that that is an elephant in the room that quite frankly, I'm not afraid to state. So there, Bob, there are a couple of different um, things that happened over the the spring and the summer and the fall. There was the um, the CARES Act funding, and then there was the 20% cuts to state aid that occasionally would happen. Do we know whether the Cuomo administration is going to restore that 20% cut, and how will it restore it? Well, the short answer is we don't know, and I would just say, you know, I, I, we've characterized the region's proposals as inadequate, but I also let off by saying uh, it's hard to know what to advocate next year because of the uncertainties of the financial condition of the state. Yeah. Uh, I think we don't get out of this with more revenue, uh, you know, however, that is, uh, however that is generated. With regard to the cuts, what, this, what the state has done to this point, uh, over the summer, there were school aid payments uh, that the state withheld 20% from, 20% across the board, uh, no targeting of that. They've also withheld uh, funds 20% uh, from various grant programs. Uh, the budget director had a column in the Albany Times Union uh, back in September. He said that if additional help from Washington is not forthcoming, then uh, we will work with the legislature to, uh, uh, to implement a plan that takes district need into account for any actions going forward. The implication of that is if Washington doesn't come through with the help we need, what's done is done. The withholdings that have been done so far, those become permanent. And to the extent that there are additional cuts that are needed, those would be done in a more targeted fashion. But it's um, all contingent on what Washington does or doesn't do. Exactly. We, we spoke with Betty Rosa, who's the interim SED commissioner uh, last or a couple weeks ago, and she said that the region's request would be uh, based in reality, Jasmine. So, I mean, it's inadequate, but, but I think where she's coming from, it's based in reality according to the money that New York knows that it has now, which isn't a lot. I mean, I think perception, reality is like, whose reality are you thinking about? Right now, Governor Cuomo, uh, the budget director with the 20% withholdings, they're saying they're choosing to balance the budget on the backs of students, on the backs of the homeless, on the backs of the working class and the poor. And what we're saying is that's a choice. You do not have to do that. New York has billionaires and millionaires who are wealthier now than they were before the pandemic started. If they paid what they owed, if they contributed to this economy as much as they extracted from our economy, then we would have more than enough money to fully fund our schools. We would have more so, than enough money to invest in communities. And so the reality is that they are choosing to balance the budget on the most vulnerable New Yorkers, and that's absolutely wrong. And we should think of our budget as a moral document and they need to do better. So Jasmine, you know what the governor would say, um, or at least has said in the past, you know, the more we tax these billionaires, the more of them are going to move out. And, you know, the goose that laid the golden egg is going to die. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, Governor Cuomo said, I talk to the billionaires every day. I call them in the Hamptons and, and, and the Hudson Valley. And I was like, yeah, that's New York. They haven't left. <laughs> They're hiding out in their homes in the Hamptons. They're hiding out in the Hudson Valley. They are still here. Um, the myth of the moving millionaires has been debunked. The last time we raised taxes on the ultra rich, New York ended up with more millionaires and not less. Um, and so Governor Cuomo needs to stop protecting the ultra rich and start protecting our children. And I think people need to call him out on that. He goes 
hard to protect the wealthy. We will not tax them. We can't hurt them. We have to make sure they're okay. What about children? What about a kindergarten kid? What about their education? Do we not have a moral obligation to make sure they're protected, that they have the tools and resources they need? And at this point, he's saying, I will throw the children under the bus so I can protect the ultra rich. And those are the wrong priorities. So Paula, did you want to add anything to that before I move on to the digital divide? Well, I just want to add, you know, the fact that um, we decide what the priorities are, right? And so there isn't an option to say, well, you know what, we're just not going to fund hospitals the way that we need to right now because we're, you know, but we, we can't say that we're in a pandemic and we understand that this is job one. And what we need to do is we need to reframe our thinking about what is necessary in a society. And we cannot morally, really, I can't go to bed at night thinking about the fact that students don't have what they need, that our educators don't have what they need, that we're all being taxed in this system from a socio-emotional health standpoint, as well as, you know, from the reading, writing, and arithmetic that we like to think about with schools if we don't have the funding to make that happen. So we just need to reframe our thinking. And once we do that, everything else falls into place. If we realize that educating students well and being there to support families in this time is really just not an option. We have to do it. So moving on to the digital divide, which is, it's all related, it's all linked here. Um, has that exacerbated the state's challenges uh, to providing a sound basic education? And if so, how? Yeah, I'd say the experience with the pandemic has sort of illuminated gaps that we all you know, sensed were there. Uh, and I'd say, you know, last March, school districts had to pivot on almost a moment's notice from in-person instruction to remote instruction, uh, you know, continuing instruction in some fashion, providing student meals and so forth. And uh, you know, many districts were able to rely on online instruction, but not all. Some had to use their school buses to deliver paper packets of instructional materials. But as a result of this experience, I think school superintendents and other people working in schools, they've gained an acute understanding of where the gaps are in internet access. And we did a survey last, uh, last spring and you know, superintendents estimated that an average of about 90% of their students had internet access, but only less than a third of districts said all our students have access. So there are gaps in many, many places and they're typically where you would expect low income communities, cities, uh, and also rural areas where you right. have low income, but also challenges of geography, you know, uh, you know, cell signals, signals from satellites just do not reach homes. And uh, the uh, uh, companies have not extended wiring to, uh, to these homes and communities. So I wanna go back to Paula for a second. Um, the, Betty Rosa, again, told Capital Tonight that, that remote learning has especially hurt low-income students who uh, are now feeling, on top of everything else, isolated. Um, and emotionally stressed by what's going on. Um, this is going to take uh, a lot of help from the state in terms of um, resources. What do you recommend? H how do you recommend we talk to people who don't want to raise taxes about this issue? Well, so, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's all hard, right? So choose your heart because we're going to pay for this on the front end or the back end. And that's the reality. Of what, the yeah, what do you mean by that? Because yeah, that's a very exactly. good point. Sure. So what I mean is that um, we're going to see externalizing behaviors, um, you know, whether that is an increase, um, you know, in students acting out. There were some early uh, concerns about, you know, criminal behavior. And I'm certainly not here to suggest, you know, that everything is going awry and that, I, and that our students are doing horrible things because they're not. But what I am saying is that, you know, every action really leads to an equal and opposite reaction. And we have to take care. Let's think about what our students have gone through. They are more, students who are low income are more likely to have had a person in their family who suffered from COVID. So they're more likely to have had it in their household. That means 
means that they've also experienced deaths because the thousands of people that died, they didn't die in a colony somewhere. They are a part of families. They have been embedded into our communities. And then let's think about what has happened in terms of um, racial unrest, in terms of feelings of safety, in terms of the murder of George Floyd and those types of things. So these are all collective traumas that students are experiencing. So we need to be thinking about funding that goes to schools. We need to be thinking about what happens to um, those um, um, the, the organizations in our communities that are also propping up, quite frankly, the, the social infrastructure of those communities, whether that means counseling or therapy. You know, if, 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 if folks on this panel are having a hard time, we've probably got a beeline to be able to see someone to help us out. And a lot of our students don't have that. A lot of them are also living in cramped settings where frankly, you know, they are, they are home all day. And what we're not talking about is that some of these students are home by themselves because their families don't have a choice. It's either they're gonna feed them or they're gonna be there by themselves. And they tell them, don't answer the door, don't use the stove, eat the sandwich I left for you. That is stressful for a child. And so we're really gonna have to think about if we, we, we have no choice but to take care of these things because we're gonna see it, if not externalizing behaviors, then we'll see internalizing behaviors with students who are really just not able to cope as they move up the latter and get older in our society. So Jasmine, we're, we're talking about uh, a moment in which there's not a lot of money, there's really no money, yet the needs of the children who were already needy before COVID are now even greater. Um, so, you know, it seems like mental health services, social services, community schools should all be um, sort of underscored in this next budget, yes? Absolutely. Uh, we should have social and emotional learning. We really need to get to how we're looking at the whole child, right? Kids don't just come to school for math and reading. They come to school to learn a whole host of skills. And one of them is coping. How do you cope with trauma and stress? And are we arming kids with the support and tools that they need? Community schools, actually, uh, some of them in New York State and in New York City did an amazing job during the pandemic of supporting their families. Uh, they had already the infrastructure in place to know how to reach out to those families. They knew what they were vulnerable to missing and really tried hard to fill in those gaps. And for a lot of those community schools, they haven't missed the beat as much as possible. And they've really kept in touch with their kids and, um, and they're still coming to school where, when they can. And if they're not, they're checking in on those students um, all the time. And that is clearly a model for going forward that the community schools that look at the whole child that have the infrastructure and supports in place to direct um, the parents to community support are absolutely essential. Um, the community schools have become a one-stop shop for parents. Uh, when they need help, they go into the school. Uh, instead of missing days of school, the kids actually come to school more often. And it just shows us that we need to invest more in community schools and we need to invest more in mental health supports for our children. So Bob, I know that the, the um, New York State Council of Superintendents has sort of a, um, a priority list of what it, what it wants to do. Um, I think a couple of years ago, we were, we were talking at the Capitol and, and you told me that one of them is updating the foundation aid formula, which is the primary formula by which the state um, you know, gets, uh, gets money to, to school districts. How important is that now? Jasmine said that it's important to fund the formula, but what about updating the formula? Well, uh, you know, as, as Jasmine said, the state is nearly $4 billion behind in funding the formula as it is. And we're faced with these, you know, devastating prospects with you know, revenues which have plunged because of the pandemic. So how we fund what we have now is a challenge. But you know, what we've talked about over the years is the idea of a financial sustainability agenda. And part of yes. that is giving districts uh, more predictability in their revenues, you know. Which businesses need too. Yeah, uh, you know, changes in the tax cap. Right now it starts as the lesser of 2% or inflation. We'd say just make it 2%, uh, you know, plus or minus the exclusions that are allowed. Uh, allow districts to put aside money the way uh, that, you uh, uh, municipalities can, and the legislature did something about that, allowing them to set aside money for their teacher pension obligations, some help on costs. But the cornerstone really has to be more predictability in, in state aid. And that's why we put a priority on the foundation aid formula. You know, 
I always characterize as an underappreciated achievement in public policy, not just the level of funding, but also the fact that it used factors that people could understand and debate, uh, and that it did promise more predictability and aid going forward. So I think that is still something to, to aspire to. But it's, it's some of those factors that inform the formula are 20 years old. Uh, yes, you know, there are factors like how do you measure pupil needs, uh, account for differences in the cost of running schools across regions. That's never been updated. Uh, uh, you know, the, the weightings for, for student needs, uh, so forth. And ideally, those would be things that would be uh, would be undertaken. But right now, as I said, we have a huge challenge in paying for what we have. So uh, Paula, schools are going to be looking to reopen uh, those that haven't been open after the holiday. That is again, another cost to make sure that schools are safe to reopen. What else should people who are listening to this conversation know about reopening schools safely and the costs involved? Well, you know, um, I, I just wanna just uh, talk uh, for a second about what Bob just stated. I mean, the reality is that if we don't update the formula, we're always gonna be trying to catch up. We're always gonna be a day late and a dollar short. And we're always going to be thinking about these dollars in not exactly the right way. So I, you know, I think that we should, we shouldn't be, um, we should be open to the idea of doing both at once. One of the things that we're gonna to have to think about, obviously, if we're gonna get educators back in classrooms and educators want to be there for their students, we know that there's no question about that, but they wanna do that safely. They're living in intergenerational households. Some of them are medically fragile agile themselves and so on. So now we're talking about a vaccine. Um, we need to be thinking about prioritizing educators for the um, for those vaccines. You know, we saw yesterday or the day before, I think it was a nurse who was the first. Obviously, um, our healthcare workers need to be prioritized. Educators need to be too, and that will certainly incur a cost. We have to also think about the safety protocols and how that fits into the budget, because we cannot reopen unless we are obviously adhering to all the safety protocols that are necessary. Uh, in New York City, for example, we're doing uh, testing intermittently, um, randomly, and that needs to continue in order for us to be sure that the environment is safe. Because you have to remember that depending on where students live in New York State, they are taking public transportation to come to school. So even if school is safe, sometimes you know how to get there might be a little bit fraught. So we've got to be thinking Thinking about all of those things. I think that we also need to be thinking of places where, um, you know, where we can sort of redistribute dollars um, based on the realities. Like, are there cost savings that can be incurred because we are now in the pandemic? Are there, you know, are there places that we may not be paying for as much? Can we think about how we order textbooks? Can we think about, you know, how, uh, you know, how we use, um, you know, virtual platforms? But that also requires making sure that educators um, have the up-to-date training that is necessary. When we transferred over to sort of a virtual learning environment, what happened with educators was very idiosyncratic. So if I happen to be really great with computers and really looking at software all along, then I was fine and I was seamlessly moved into that environment. If I was not, then I wasn't fine, right? And so we have to think about, you know, what is nice at thinking about when they, you know, when we talk about how teachers need to be um, constant learners and what are the things that we are incorporating and what that looks like to ensure that our educators have what they need so that they can do this well, because this is a huge stressor on educators. Yeah. And as a teacher, I've just got to say that, like, it ain't easy. <laughs> And um, so shout out, you know, your teachers and, and give them whatever you can within the confines of what your district allows, um, because they deserve it. Um, so just a, a couple of things. First of all, Jasmine and Bob, do you agree with Paula that teachers should be um, among the first to, um, to get the vaccine? I think we should support and protect our educators. They are frontline workers. They are essential, um, even our child care workers as well. So I have no objections to that. How about you, Bob? Yeah, you know, if you ask, you know, what does it take to, to help schools uh, reopen safely after the holidays? First thing is, it's really in the, what, what matters is what happens in the community. Uh, the po uh, positivity rates, uh, infection rates in schools have been much lower than in the communities. That's right. Governor, governor has said it's astonishing, amazing how low they are. And where the problems have arisen in schools, it's because of 
typically because of infections in the community. And we also see a lot of schools having to close because of quarantine requirements, not because of actual infections, but because someone in the school was exposed to someone who was infected. And so you have you know, large numbers of schools having to close on that basis. So I think there is an argument for saying, you know, if we want to, uh, to uh, be able to have schools reopen, yes, we should give a priority to making sure that people who have direct contact with students uh, are our priority for receiving the, the vaccine. Um, I, I wanted to just pick up on something else that Paula said, Jasmine. Um, she said that the foundation aid formula does need to be updated. <laughs> I'm not sure if you agree with that. I wanted to respond to that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one, the state has never fully funded the foundation aid formula. The biggest flaw in the formula is not the formula itself, is the state legislature and the governor's failure to fully fund it. Um, and when everyone who says we should update it, it's like, it's gonna be more expensive, not less, right? Like we should increase the waiting for English language learners. We probably should add something for homeless students. Things that we would do to make the formula better are only gonna make it more expensive. And so, you know, we've always said fund the formula first so we can see what happens to school districts when you actually implement a well thought out formula and let's see what they need. And then let's reevaluate how we could fix it and make it even better. And so we said fund it and then fix it. And we say that because we don't want to get distracted and like, oh, we're not, we're going to throw out foundation. Yet. I think like Bob said, it is, is a huge victory that we have a formula that's based on equity um, that our courts kind of validate it. And so we want to make sure that formula remains intact and it remains as a state law. And Governor Cuomo tried to uh, get rid of the foundation aid formula too many times for us to want to have this debate while he's still in office. <laughs> Perhaps after he's gone, you ask me again and maybe my, my response will be different. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, I, I want to know what's going on around assessments, student assessments, teacher assessments. Paula, will there be a regents test this year? What kind of questions and what kind of answers do you have? So we're not looking um, at having a regents test this year. Um, there, there, there is a movement afoot, and there are lots of folks who feel that we shouldn't have assessments because, um, you know, the rollout of virtual learning has been far too uneven. Students are already stressed. Educators are already stressed, and so we should just really forego assessments this year. I um, am, you know, of the thinking, you know, that we need to have information um, in order for us to know what has been the fallout of this time. And so I certainly would never advocate for high stakes assessments. That would be completely inappropriate at this time. And I don't know that we have those anyway, you know, because you know teachers aren't being evaluated with these assessments or anything like that. But we we have to know. In some cases, some educators are saying some students seem to actually be thriving a little bit better at home. Maybe students who were bullied or students who may have anxiety and so on. I don't right. So we need to have some information about what has 2020 or the FY21, the school year of 2021, what has that meant for learning for our students, right? We need to know how that's been differentiated by, you know, whether it's socioeconomic status, whether by race, whether by students um, of unique populations. We need to have information. And I am someone, you know, I think we should be testing people for COVID. I think that, you know, I, I am not about penalizing folks to, um, based on the information that we find, but I, it has been my experience that information is power. And as an educator, I have always sought more information, not less. And I think that we should be doing that with assessments. Um, and, you know, of course we have to think about what is the best way to administer them. Um, they certainly would not look the way that they have before. They may not be of the same length, et cetera, et cetera. But there does need to be some level of standardization in order for us to learn what we can about what this year has meant for our students. We do have a question. This is from Anonymous who asks, how about holding the many lotteries that are targeting the marginalized communities? They are required to provide education funding and they are not being held accountable. Um, so does anybody feel that they want to answer that? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure, you know, what, what the uh, uh, person is, is trying to ask there, but I, you know, I think the lottery is a significant source of funding, but, uh, you know, education is approaching a $70 billion enterprise in New York State. I don't recall what the, the lottery contributes now, but it's a small proportion. I would say I do have a concern about 
uh, relying on what amount to regressive revenue sources to pay for, for state services. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, if you calculate how much uh, the state uh, generates in lottery sales each year, and divide it by the population of the state, it's, it's a big number. And there are people like me who go years without buying a lottery ticket. So it, it is, you know, I'm grateful for the revenue it provides for schools, but I am concerned about, you know, the, the impact on, on, on individuals. Anybody else want to comment on that? So just add, uh, I think majority yeah. of the lottery funding actually goes to fund the lottery and <laughs> what is left over goes to education. And so I don't think there's been many mismanagement there. Um, in the state education uh, budget proposal, the uh, authors cite a 2011 study which found that New York state education had the least organizational resource capacity of any other state based on the ratio of staff to students. The agency uh, that they, they are saying by insinuating has been hurt by a hiring freeze and budget cuts. Now, amid all of these student needs, Jasmine, should state ed be better funded? Yes, it, I, I mean, state ed is treated like the black sheep when it comes to the Department of Budget. Uh, they are the one agency that the governor does not control. Uh, they are supposed to be independent, uh, rightfully so. Um, and it's almost like they're punished for that. And the, and the state education department and the Board of Regents to typically have been aggressive with their um, their proposals. They have ignored the governor's 2% spending cap because that's not based on what kids need. And it's almost like they get penalized or punished by the state for not falling in line or for the governor not having as much control. And the way he does that is he withholds money from the agency. Um, state ed handles so much from not just our K to 12 education, but like your nail technician getting a license. Um, they, the state education department handles everything that requires any sort of licensure from New York state. And we need to make sure that they have the resources to do their job um, and they don't. And so we really do need to invest in state ed as a entity, uh, value them and allow them to continue to be independent of the governor's office um, and really make sure they get the funding that they're supposed to get. They're also, uh, Bob, they, they want to uh, eliminate one level of that transparency disclosure. There are, I guess, a couple of different levels. One is the federal transparency and the other one is uh, uh, the one that the governor put into the budget. What do you think about that? Time to get rid of it? Uh, well, we would support that. You know, right now uh, under the federal Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, Success Act, whatever, uh, every state was required to uh, to implement uh, a system whereby uh, spending by school uh, school would be reported, and uh, so that's for federal requirement, and that's actual expenditures. What the governor proposed and what was enacted was a similar report, but on allocations, what districts plan to spend. Now, yes, perhaps there's some value to it, but in the scheme of things. I just don't feel that it's a priority to make school districts do this twice. Yeah. School administrators have had tremendous demands placed on them with complying with uh, all the requirements around reopening safely, uh, reporting what's happening with regard to uh, COVID testing, uh, you know, uh, positive uh, cases in their schools and in their communities. Uh, so there are already tremendous uh, administrative demands upon schools. And this just does not seem like it's a priority to have school districts do this twice. The federal uh, uh, report should be sufficient. So um, I'm just gonna ask each of you to give like a 30 second wrap. So is somebody else talking? Okay, so Paula, why don't we start with you? Yeah, let's reopen schools safely. Um, let's prioritize that. Let's prioritize our, um, our students and their families. Um, let us be sure to address the inequitable access to high quality virtual learning. And that starts with digital equity from broadband all the way down to devices. And, um, you know, that doesn't happen by clicking our heels. It happens by funding it. Um, and then let's pay attention to the socio-emotional toll that this time has taken on students. And we can do all of that. Um, and, you know, I think the choice is ours. And I would just implore our new legislators legislators to really be thinking about what matters to their communities and where they're going to see the biggest bang for their buck um, is always going to be investing in our youth, investing in families, and investing in our schools. Bob Lowry, final words. 
Yeah, I've stressed the uh, financial challenges that the state and school, schools face. Over the years, you and I, though, have talked about the surveys we've done of superintendents and the huge concern about and growing concern about student mental health. And that yeah. preceded the onset of the pandemic. And that has grown with the pandemic. One of the questions we asked in a survey last spring was, you know, concerns about the impact of the pandemic on both academic uh, uh, success and on uh, emotional, social well-being. Uh, concern about the academic impact that tended to be highest in higher poverty districts and higher in the higher grades. But there was concern all over about the effect uh, on uh, students' uh, social and emotional well-being. So that continues to be a challenge. And just on SED, you know, I'd say we focus on the ability to do uh, online learning at all, internet access. But there are also questions about you know, how do we do it well. And that's an area where, yes, it would be helpful to have an education department that was better funded, that had a capacity to provide that kind of you know, guidance and expertise to school districts. And we cannot fairly ask that of, of the department at this time. Final word, Jasmine Gripper. I'm gonna take from Bob's opening remarks, funding, funding, funding. Uh, our school districts need funding. It's important that as we go into the 2021 budget process, our legislators think of their job as protecting children and not billionaires. It's time to tax the ultra rich and really give our districts and our schools and our students the resources they need to not only survive, but to thrive in this moment. Thank you. So I don't see any questions. So I think we're gonna wrap up, Zach, if that's okay. We have. Jasmine Gripper to thank. Uh, she's the executive director of the Alliance for Quality Education. We have Bob Lowry to thank. He's with the New York State School, uh, New York State Council of School Superintendents, and Paula White, who's the executive director of E for E New York. You guys are terrific. Don't be surprised if I call you to be on my show. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks so much, panelists. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, she thank delivered, you. as always, a great discussion on education policy. Um, before I introduce our last panel, um, I did want to give out a uh, give a shout out to our great events team that made all of this possible, as well as our great sponsors, Brown and Weinrob, Long Point Advisors, and Ostruff Associates. And I think I spied on our attendees list assembly member. Uh, Richard Gottfried, who of course chairs the health committee, who is just two weeks away from setting the record as the longest serving legislator in state history. So without further ado, uh, I wanna hand it off to Shannon Young. She's the Albany health reporter with Politico New York, uh, really steeped in these healthcare uh, issues with the pandemic going on. Um, this will be our final panel. Shannon. Thank you, Zach, and thanks everyone for joining me here today. Um, there's been no shortage of health news this year. Uh, went a little bit different direction than we thought it was gonna be at the end of uh, 2019 and beginning of this year, but I'm happy to be here and leading this panel. Um, before we get started here, I'm just gonna introduce um, our panelists and let them uh, talk a little bit for a couple seconds here about what they do. Um, we're gonna start here uh, with Bill Hammond of the Empire Center. Hi, um, I'm Bill Hammond senior fellow for health policy at the Empire Center. Um, and before that, for many years, I was a reporter at the Capitol and I ended my career as a political columnist and opinion writer at the Daily News. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, we also have Elizabeth Benjamin with us here, who is the vice president of health initiatives for Community Service Society. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I work at the Community Service Society of New York. We run a number of state consumer assistance programs um, that either enroll people who are in coverage or help them resolve medical bills or address insurance denials. And we all together serve about 130,000 New Yorkers every year in every single county of New York State. So I'm sure that we're serving many of your constituents as we speak because this is uh, getting the this close of the first month of open enrollment for January 1st. So it's time to sign up for coverage if you haven't. All right, and then we also have Kent Hannon, who is counsel for Brown and Weinrub. Kent, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, I'm counsel for Brown and Weinrub. We do a lot of government representation. I do only healthcare. And um, I'm also a health fellow at Pasteur University where I've been doing a number of online forums and before uh, joining Brown Weinrob, I had been the chair of the Senate Health Committee for over 20 years. 
All right, and then finally, um, last but certainly not least, we have uh, the New York Department of Aging Commissioner, Lorraine Cortez Vasquez with us. Hello, thank you so much. Happy to be here, Shannon. I'm Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, and as Shannon said, I'm the commissioner for the Department for the Aging currently, but I've spent many years in government. Uh, as Secretary of State during the Spitzer Patterson terms, as well as uh, served as a chief of staff to a assemblyman who was also a Bronx Democratic chair many years ago. Um, and um, I also want to just, I'm so glad that you're hosting this region, um, these sessions for new um, members of the assembly. And because it's really important because as an area agency on aging, there's a lot of synergy between New York, Buffalo, Rochester, and there's a lot of similarities. So as I speak about aging issues, I just want people to know that there is applicability to some other regions across the state. All right, well, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so as I said, even before uh, COVID-19 hit New York, healthcare policy was a major issue in Albany. We entered 2020 with a budget shortfall that was largely driven by Medicaid spending. And everyone thought that 2020 was gonna be a big year for Medicaid. That was gonna be the big topic of discussion in Albany. There was the newly reformed Medicaid redesign team and the governor was making it a major priority issue to sort of look at reimagining that program. A Couple months in, right before the budget's due, we get our first COVID case and everybody knows how that has sort of played out now. And so now we are nine months in the pandemic we just got vaccines delivered to the state and we're starting to sort of go through all of the complications that are following that phase of the COVID pandemic. And we're all grappling with how the state's gonna come out of this financially and what that means for the state's budget and for future budgets. And so I think today's panel, we're gonna sort of look at where we are now, how we got here and where healthcare policies in New York could go and where they should go. Um, and so first I'm just gonna going to tackle the issue that's sort of on everyone's mind. It's the, the financial issue here. And so um, Bill just wanted to get, and I'll go through everybody here on the panel, but just wanted to get your take on how the coronavirus pandemic has affected New York's financial situation and what we're seeing and, and what that means for the state, for the state budget. Well, the main effect it's had has been on the revenue side. It's, uh, you know, the economy underwent this just extraordinarily rapid crash um, and revenue kind of went off a cliff. And um, there have been some additional expenses, right? Uh, the, the costs related to responding to the pandemic. Um, those have been partly offset by extra federal aid. So uh, the, the big effect has been on the revenue side. And it, ironically, that's also the way it's played out in the healthcare industry itself. Uh, obviously, there were some providers who were really hard hit with a lot of patients and, and the expenses that went with that in March, especially in March and April. Um, but I would say uh, as big or bigger impact, financially speaking, has been the loss of revenue that they suffered when the governor suspended elective procedures. Um, that was especially um hard for upstate providers who weren't seeing a lot of coronavirus patients and, and many of them had to lay off employees temporarily. And Kim, obviously uh, Medicaid, healthcare issues and the budget have always sort of been a major issue in Albany, but how is this different? How is the coronavirus pandemic and, and the financial fallout we're seeing different from how things have, have happened in the past year? Usually it's some type of institutional change that is change, uh, challenging people, or if it's not institutional, it's just a question of affordability of the individual. Can I, can I cover my medical costs? We're right now challenged by, can the entities survive? Can the staffing of the entities survive? How are people going to individually cope with all of the healthcare? What are the long-term hangover costs and, and effects of COVID? Um, so it's, it's just not, there's no, been no precedent. And health, unlike many of the other areas, is really an intricate uh, web of federal and state uh, policy and statutes and money. And uh, it's been challenged, obviously, even more. As we speak today, 
the, the Congress, um, Pelosi and McConnell are meeting uh, to decide whether or not they're gonna have another stimulus act. I mean, and yet New York state is hanging by fingernails as to whether that happens. So this is all unprecedented. And Elizabeth, what are you seeing? How is this affecting organizations across the state, especially we're hearing um, you know, safety net programs and local based programs are really are really hitting a hard time right now. And there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, not just from Congress, but what they're going to get in terms of state financial help. I'd like to pivot my answer away from organizations and to people. Um, the COVID pandemic is, you know, having a devastating effect on our friends, our neighbors, you know, our constituents, everybody we serve. Unemployment, you know, is at 9%. People are losing job-based coverage. Where can they go to get coverage? The Medicaid program. And so I think the COVID, the Medicaid program is really showing it's, um, you know, how vital it is to, to serving people in the middle of a, you know, a once in a hundred year catastrophe. Um, and so I think, you know, we're having the wrong conversation. The conversation, to the extent we're having it, shouldn't be about cutting back the Medicaid program. In fact, I would argue time to scrap the cap. You know, right now there's been this long Medicaid cap that really is sort of inappropriate in the middle of a, a pandemic. And we should scrap the cap and invest in healthcare and invest in healthcare, you know, quite aggressively. In terms of, um, you know, I, the other thing that I think is really important to understand is that when we do talk about what's happening with COVID, you know, people of color are four times more likely to die from COVID upstate twice as time likely to die downstate. And one of the reasons why we are seeing these incredible disparities in COVID um, morbidity and mortality is that we have not invested as a state in making sure that there are safety net um, hospitals, there are safety net um, community providers that are there to address the incredible disparities in health equity and the incredible health equity inequity the, that we are visualizing. And so, when you have a huge pandemic, you know, go through those, those disparities have been there and they've been exacerbated. I would argue for some policy reasons I'm happy to get into later by the last 30 years, like sort of, you know, I think not the best policy decisions. And so we really need to rethink our, ourselves and invest in healthcare, not divest from healthcare. That's, you know, that's my answer to this fiscal problem. You know, I think it's kind of a misnormal, misnomer. And before we, we dig into some of those issues deeper, Lorraine, just wanted to get your take on things. Obviously, New York City faces its own major financial challenges that have been sparked by this pandemic. It's, it has its own healthcare system, its funding, its own programs, its own populations it's serving, and New York City was hit hardest by the pandemic, especially this spring. Um, so what are, what are you keeping your eye on here? I think we're keeping our eye um... Fortunately, uh, in aging services, it is a combination of city, state, and federal funding. And the state money primarily comes as, as a pass-through from the federal government. And I think as Bill had mentioned earlier, what saved us this cycle was the federal uh, emergency, emergency management money that we received primarily targeted towards uh, food insecurity and also on social isolation issues. And so that really helped us. But I think the issue for us has been the fungibility of, of that money. Right now it is very targeted. So in-home services are targeted. Uh, community health uh, uh, and community-based services are targeted. And what we would like, and one of the things that Elizabeth, that Elizabeth talked about was that exchange, because we see more and more, not only a need for health, but we also want less institutionalization and more living in the community so that older adults, and this is through, uh, true throughout the state, that older adults can live in their home, in their community with dignity and the supports that they need. So what we're looking for, and hope the state could be a leader in that, is looking at some fungibility across those funding lines. Great, um, and so just to, to follow up with Lorraine was saying, uh, obviously long-term care, um, people's ability to live in the communities has become a major issue that's been highlighted by the pandemic. We've seen 
thousands of cases in nursing homes across the state, deaths, there's been a lot of controversy over the state's handling of COVID in nursing homes and its response. This was an issue that lawmakers looked at this summer, uh, passed a couple bills, but there's been a lot of talk about the need for more reform in this area. And so Lorraine, uh, what, what do you think needs to be done in aging a little bit more specifically um, in terms of what should the state be investing in? How do you move forward past COVID and meet people where they need to be, um, you know, who don't, who don't have any other options or, or any other choice, but, but to get long-term care? You know, yeah, one of the things we always say is never let a good pandemic go to waste and not have some great learning experiences from it. And COVID was the one that revealed it, particularly in this area. We understand, you know, the nursing home situation just hit everyone in a way that we never expected it to do. But I think it also highlighted some of the needs and the reforms that, that are required in nursing home um, jurisdiction. New York City does not manage nursing homes. New York City, uh, that is a state responsibility. So I think that's an important area. And we believe that nursing homes are essential. Um, for you know, for, for the medically for the for the medically needed, and um, but what we really would love is to see more more resources so that people can age in place. I will not, I will say that over and over and over again because this pandemic showed us that when you're able to take people care of their people in their homes, you can keep them safe. So we would love to see more funding for things that we call NORCs. Um, naturally occurring uh, communities where people are aging in place and then they are they have some wraparound services that include both nursing services, recreational and educational services, as well as much needed in-home services. And we would love to see more of that locality. But we also know that given the growing population, that's going to happen whether we plan for it or not. And so I'm saying to all of us, let's be wise as legislators, let's be wise as leaders and start planning for that explosive growth that New York is going to have and where those naturally occurring regions are going to exist. Um, and we can see that we, we have 28 so far, there are hundreds of them uh, throughout the state. Now, why don't we organize them as we've organized senior centers as we've organized nursing homes. So we need to start looking at what our priorities are. Right now, the funding is skewed towards institutionalization. And what we want to see is a little more parity in institutionalization, as well as dignified living in your own community and aging in place. Thank you. And, and Bill, obviously, Empire Center has had a lot to say, uh, a lot of criticism of the governor's handling of this, his data transparency on cases, on deaths in nursing homes. Um, what would you like to see come out of this pandemic in terms of, of you know, nursing home policies and, and how data like this is even conveyed to the public? Well, the, the we're, as you as you know, we're involved in a freedom of information lawsuit. We're trying to get um, the full count of mortality in nursing homes as it stands now. They're only releasing the people who die physically within the homes and and that no other state does it that way to my knowledge. And it, it, it tends to skew the, the analysis and the comparison of New York to other states. This is not, that situation where the Department of Health is resisting giving out information that's clearly public and that we're clearly entitled to, that isn't particularly unusual. Anybody who's filed a FOIL with the state, uh, especially reporters, could tell you similar stories about being strung along. Um, and so that is an area where um, I'm not sure what the answer is, but the FOIL law has um, flaws in it that make it possible for public officials to withhold public information. It'd be nice if that didn't happen. Um, I, I want to weigh in though on something something that Elizabeth said in some of the, uh, the, the general tenor of this discussion. And that is the idea that we should, that the way we should learn from the pandemic and is that we should invest more in healthcare. And 
I guess I would start by saying we, we spend an awful lot on healthcare in New York State. Uh, the United States spends more than the rest of the world and New York State spends more than most states. Um, but also that the, the thing that we should be focused on in a pandemic is not the acute care system, but the public health system. The, the part of the system that prevents pandemics from happening keeps them as small as possible and minimizes them once they get going. Because the reason that you saw those disproportionate deaths in the black community and the poor community is because they were uh, predominantly because they were essential workers because they were exposed. Um, it wasn't because, it, I mean, maybe there was some issues with care and access to care and things like that, but pr primarily it's because they got sick because we had a pandemic. And so if you want to protect the vast majority of New Yorkers, and if you especially want to protect vulnerable New Yorkers, you have to keep the virus from spreading in the first place. So that's what I think should be the first priority. To the extent we have any money to invest, I think we should be investing it on that front end detection and prevention and mitigation in the public health system. And Elizabeth, since Bill invoked your name, I'm, I'm gonna allow you just to, to weigh in here. Well, I mean, 30 it's sort seconds of to respond. No, no, no. Well, I mean, I, in some, in many ways, I think Bill and I actually are in violent agreement with each other. Um, of course, it would be better to invest in a robust public health system. And I think Bill and I have joined forces and, you know, many times on the fact that the way we invest in our hospital system is, you know, in many cases, quite foolish. So for example, we have a program designed to support um, hospitals that disproportionately serve people who are, you know, low income. Um, and that's called the indigent care uh, pool program. And that is spread around like peanut butter in New York state, as Kemp and Bill and I have been talking about for several decades, instead of being targeted like every other state in the country does to the top 25% of true safety net hospitals. So we've been divesting from our safety net hospitals. And as a result, we've lost, you know, we went from 75,000 beds to 55,000 beds since we decided to, and this is probably where Bill and I disagree, and I'm sure Kemp and I disagree, where we decided to go for a free market healthcare system, which is essentially survival of the fittest. And we got that. And as a result, places like Queens have 1.5 beds per thousand people. They've lost four, maybe five hospitals in Queens. And the Upper East Side has, you know, Upper East Side, I mean, all of Manhattan has 6.4 beds per thousand people. And, and PS, and, and Northwell, one of, one of the state's biggest hospital systems wants to build a new 40 floor trophy hospital just where we don't need healthcare and more healthcare capacity. So I think, you know, in the 90s, we decided we were going to throw out our hospital rate setting system, which kind of fairly reimbursed hospitals, you know, safety net and, and, and the non and the um, academic medical centers and private and voluntary hospitals, sort of similarly or relatively fairly. And we also threw out any semblance of meaningful health, regional health planning. And as a result, you know, those chickens are coming home to roost and we have a really pretty unfair healthcare system where extreme, we're, we're seeing more consolidation, more, um, and, and what happens when you allow consolidation in healthcare, prices go up. And I think this is sort of, you know, why, and so now we have an extremely expensive system, just as Bill said, but it's because of de deregulation. And so I think our responses, I mean, I can't speak for Bill or Kemp, but I would say what we need is more, we need to rethink this whole system and whether that's the New York Health Act or going back to a hospital um, rate setting system or having really meaningful health planning so that we do invest in public health and we do invest primary care, all that promised primary care that was supposed to happen when we closed all these hospitals never materialized in poor communities. And so we really, really need to rethink how we're doing this healthcare system in New York state because what we got is not working and it's definitely not working in a healthcare pandemic. But even before the pandemic, you know, over, I think over the vast majority of people were terrified that they couldn't afford their health care if they got sick. And that's because we have built a very expensive system that is not regulated in the way it should be to ensure that we all have relatively equal access to a basic level of health care, which, you know, the New York Health Act would do, which 
a global rate setting system would do. Um, and so I think we really have to think deeply about what we're doing here because it's not fair and people are dying. Right, and I know Elizabeth, I know that your sentiments are shared by um, a lot of a lot of people. Um, the, the, the chairs of the Senate and the Assembly Health Committees have both really been pushing for the New York Health Act, which would create a Medicare for all type or universal health care system in New York State. Um, there's been debate over the merits of such a system, the cost of such a system, and a lot of people have sort of said it's sort of a pipe dream. Um, but as we're having this conversation right now about where do we go now, now that we've seen how our healthcare system is in a pandemic, we've seen the state, you know, have all of its hospitals work together uh, on, on bed sharing, on patient loads, um, you know, just sort of a, a universal response here. And I think there really is a conversation that we're going to start hearing louder and louder in Albany about this type of policy in our healthcare system. And so Kemp, I'm going to allow you to just respond to what Elizabeth said, but uh, looking forward to our future here in healthcare, what do you see being uh, a path that, that New York, in your opinion, should, should follow? Should it be something like the New York Health Act, or should there be something else that we're looking at? Well, Elizabeth's use of the word rethink is correct. After that, we disagree. But <laughs> um, going back two decades to total control of the system, that didn't work. Going ahead to the uh, universal health care might work, but the current that current proposal, we don't have enough money. The first thing we have to do right now, we have to figure out about our workforce for the health care because they're pretty tired. There's not enough and we need to deal with it. The second thing we need to do is what are the directions health care was already taking? And some of it have, have accelerated during the pandemic. Telehealth. It has worked quite well in regard to acute care. It's worked quite well for geriatric care. It may well be a, a way in the future for nursing homes. We have to take advantage of that. And any number of the executive orders that the governor has issued have loosened up uh, the over-regulatory system that we have in the state. So we need to do that. The healthcare system was already moving away from hospitals uh, outpatient, almost 50% of the procedures were, were outpatient as opposed to in, in being done in the, in the hospital. We were moving away from a fee for service, not paying by the, by the yard, not paying by the, the, the procedure. We we're going into a value-based system so that there was not the incentive to do more. Those are the types of things that we're going to and will help us rethink where we are. And one of the special key things was our focus on the social determinants of health. Now, that would help to address racial disparities, not just in general care, and it would also help address the cost of, of uh, health care and, and many of the problems that we have seen exasperated uh, uh, during, <laughs> exasperated, uh, during, during the pandemic. Um, so those, the direction is rethinking but not necessarily replacing what didn't work in the past and, and trying to, when we do rethink, being able to afford what we can do. And Lorraine, just wanna let you weigh in here too. What, what things do you think need to be um, rethought here in healthcare, particularly as it comes to aging? I think, I think that there's two things. I think that the relationship with the state office and the local area agencies on aging, there needs to be a little shift in that. Right now, the uh, state office on the aging is the funnel or the vehicle of the pass through for federal dollars. And they also have regulatory and oversight on many of the programs that are run by the local area, uh, area agencies on aging. And there, there are several of them in, in New York. Um, but what, what we want them to do is to make sure that the money is distributed in a way that makes sense for that locality, rather than to have this formula that may not make sense for a particular locality. For example, if you are a rural area, then you will be doing most of your services directly in the home. But if you're urban centers like Erie, like Rochester, like New York, like Syracuse, those services are very different. For us during this pandemic, we had to balance both because New York has 
what we call suburban areas in some of the outer boroughs in Queens and in, in uh, Staten Island and in the Bronx. And yet we are very much an urban area. So we had a focus on in-home delivery as well as you know some kind of how do we transfer congregate services. It was all looking at all of those shifts and those dynamics that this pandemic caused that we were sometimes constrained by the funding and the, and the state regulations. But I think the most important thing for us, and I think as a state, we focused on two areas, which was food insecurity and social isolation, which were the two areas that affected older New Yorkers the most. Uh, and food insecurity, we had a very, very logical, well-managed well system in place that was totally disrupted because people could no longer congregate. People needed to have services delivered to their home. That kind of capacity requires a shift in focus, a shift in funding, and definitely a totally new skill set for everyone involved in that. And then the social isolation, as you all know, it's been nine months. We are all suffering from some degree of social isolation. But for an older adult, social isolation leads to severe, can lead to severe health and mental health uh, situations. It can lead to hypertension. So its impact is not only mental health, but also its impact has a lot of health consequences. And so that is one of those areas that we need to focus on and make sure that in our health system, we're dealing with all of the supports necessary for um, for social isolation. We were very fortunate that we started geriatric mental health programs in New York City well in advance of this uh, pandemic and were able to support them. But we really need to look at the way services are arrayed. And I go back to that conversation. This is a health conversation, not a budget conversation. However, budget determines programs and determines policy and determines direction. And unless we build in some fungibility in that, we will constantly find ourselves not being able to address where the greatest need arises. And, and another issue um, in the healthcare sphere that we're seeing get a little bit of more momentum, a little bit of talk now, um, given the financial situation of the pandemic has been whether New York will move forward with legalization of marijuana, uh, whether it will impose new taxes on wealthy New Yorkers. Um, I'm gonna do kind of a jump ball here. I don't know who gets it, but, but how likely are those issues at, at coming up the session and, and actually seeing movement? I think the legalizing marijuana is almost guaranteed to happen, but it's, it's um, people shouldn't overestimate its impact on finances. The experience in other states has been that it, it's a bit of a time consuming process to get the, the regulatory framework in place and that the revenue doesn't flow right away. It takes a few years. And then when it does flow, it's on the scale of tens of millions or hundreds of millions, not billions of dollars. And right now, New York State has a, a multi billion dollar hole to fill. So uh, legalizing marijuana at best would, would represent a drop in the bucket. I mean, I think there's the Revenue Coalition has, you know, six initiatives, you know, ultra millionaires tax, uh, you know, uh, uh, the wealth, uh, the, the stock transfer tax. I mean, there's a whole sort of litany of revenue um, measures that we could, in, we could, we should take a very close look at. Um, and I think what we should do, but you know what, there's stuff we can do that can help people right now that costs very little. Um, for example, we have, you know, 5% of our state's population is uninsured. A tranche of those people couldn't get insured even if they wanted to, and that's immigrants. We need to establish an immigrant coverage program. Um, my organization has costed out this um, initiative. It would cost around $400 million a year. I think that would really address a lot of the disparities we see in our healthcare system. On top of that, you know, many people who go into the Affordable Care Act um, uh, marketplace find that there's just not a, that, that the premiums are still unaffordable. If you're making $30,000 a year, you have to pay 200 bucks a month for a, a pretty high deductible product. That's just untenable for people. So we should be looking at state premium assistance programs. Um, we have to figure out a way 
to get people covered and covered affordability affordably. And I think you know, obviously the New York Act, Health Act would do that, you know, perfect. <laughs> but there are many, many things we can do right now this year as we're raising revenue and we need to raise revenue. And there are lots of great ideas on the table, um, but we just have to get out of this um, austerity mindset. It isn't working and it's not gonna work in this once in a hundred years moment. And then another issue that hasn't gotten a ton of attention this pandemic, but it, but Lorraine touched on it. It's obviously the whole mental health aspect of, of this. Um, we're seeing increases in, in mental health anxiety, depression, um, suicidal ideation, and, and drug use, and things like that. And, and these are all issues that in a normal year would be considered crises in themselves, um, but it's sort of getting swept under the radar here. And, and what do you all think the, the state needs to do to address these issues and, and um, I guess help with this, with what they're calling the fourth wave of the pandemic? And, and Elizabeth, you can start. Yeah, I'm sorry to jump in again, but I actually here is another place where I totally agree with Senator Hannon. Um, telehealth has been amazing. And one of the reasons why it's working so well is Governor Cuomo said no co-pays for telehealth. That is a really smart move. If we want to lower healthcare spending, using telehealth is obviously a more affordable option than having people go in. It's also a safer option for mental health, for people with mental health issues, having a no copay mental health visit telehealth visit is a really good thing. And so we should be really, you know, investing in telehealth, but that links back to, I think a panel or two before where we really also have to invest in universal broadband that works and isn't controlled by, you know, for-profit making entities. We just need three universal available broadband. So telehealth can work for everyone. Great, but Elizabeth, is telehealth the only answer here? I mean- oh, definitely <laughs> not. I just wanted to connect back with Kemp's yeah. point. I mean, I, there are, there are, we do need to invest much more saying. in the mental health system. The oh, other go ahead. part that was touched upon is dealing with the mental health system. We were supposed to make mental health on a par with physical health, and we have not done that. We have not integrated the system well enough with our physical health. We haven't integrated our substance abuse system well enough. And so we have separate silos where people with real problems haven't been dealt with fairly. And I totally agree with Kemp on this. And not only that, we've passed law after law after law to make the parity, what we call parity laws between mental health, substance use, and physical health. And yet, they're just violated constantly. Um, we're, you know, we have the responsibility of running the state um, independent behavioral health ombudsman and the calls we get are heartbreaking. And so we really have to, you know, we, we someone I think noted in the chat that it, you know, the insurance companies are, are quite resource rich right now because of the low utilization that's happening. They shouldn't be issuing any mental health denials, no inpatient denials for treatment. People should be encouraged to being in substance, getting substance use disorder treatment, not discouraged. There should never be a cost barrier for these services. And that we really need to dig deeper into what the, the whole insurance structure and utilization review structure, you know, why are people ever being told no for health, for mental health and substance use disorder services? And, and I, 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 the other thing is, I just want to say, I'm sorry, I'm, the last thing is that there's many people who don't have coverage at all for these services and many people that have high deductible products that discourage them from getting these services. So mental health and substance use disorder should never be subject to a deductible or cost sharing if you ask. If that's, if you want to fix that problem, that's what you should do. And we also need to fix the problem of certain populations having pre, um, people need to be educated on mental health services and make themselves readily available for, because they are so stigmatized in, in certain communities. I know that that has been one of the areas that the geriatric mental health uh, programs have had to work on is destigmatizing the whole notion of the, the necessary uh, benefits of mental health services. And I know that that is true as a person who has comes from a community of color, I know that that is another part of it. That is not something that is being funded. That essential educational piece, that is a precursor to having mental health available to many more people. And so that's, that, that is another one of those things that we constantly have to look at. As far as telemedicine, 
as people are going to either shelter in place are required to, whether it is a pandemic, whether it is a snow emergency, whether it is a heat emergency and all of the other conditions that we've been finding, we find that telemedicine, you know, is, is a very good vehicle put, and telehealth they are very, very good vehicles for older adults because of the flexibility and the accessibility. But one of the things that we've done is that we've not done enough of that and wrap and tie some of those programs to social services. So we've worked very, uh, we've partnered with a group called Capsule and Rejuvenin basically to tie those telemedicine programs and telehealth programs with social service agencies so that people can get a full complement of services. And, um, and they need to be made permanent for uh, older adults, particularly those who live at home, homebound uh, older persons. And I mean, think that is um, a key for all of us. And I keep going back to that long-term health in the community and long-term long -term care needs in the community. This could be part of that, uh, that approach. And then as we just sort of get towards the end here, I wanna give um, each of you a moment here just to um, impart some wisdom or some advice to some of the new legislators or the, um, the ones returning who are joining us here today um, on what you think their main focus should be heading into the new session and, and what policy issues you wanna really see um, be debated in Albany. And um, we'll just start with Bill. Um, well, um, I'm somebody who thinks that the Medicaid program is the most important thing that the state does. Uh, and therefore, I think it should be done well. And I think a lot of attention is paid to how much money goes into the system and not enough is paid to how, how smartly it's spent. Um, I think the, the typical member of the legislator, um, their position on health care is I want to do more of it and not, I, you know, get the next level of it gets more complicated. I don't feel like I know the answers, but I do know that, um, as you mentioned at the introduction, before the pandemic hit, we had a crisis in Medicaid and it was primarily a crisis of the expenses rising faster than they were budgeted to rise. And it wasn't because there was any big increase in enrollment. It wasn't because there was any, um, you know, uh, disease that was sweeping the state. It was because of momentum in the system and, and the way different um, rules were being interpreted and different people were taking advantage of different programs, which may or may not have been in the best interest of anyone involved, but it was, it was, it was, generating a lot of money for providers, uh, for certain providers. Uh, so if you want the healthcare system to, to work well, to serve the people in the best way possible, I think you need to pay more attention to management of the program and it, it, including issues like the one Elizabeth brought up earlier about something as simple as how you distribute indigent care funding. Uh, so uh, that would be my pitch. All right, Elizabeth, you're up next. Hi. Um, all right. Uh, so I would really encourage folks to think about what they can do right now to help people. Um, you know, people are suffering. Nine percent unemployment rate, the pandemic ramping the race into our communities. I think one of the things that we can do is, of course, consider the New York Health Act. But short of that, there are things we can do this year, some of which cost nothing. We could pass the Patient Medical Debt Protection Act and prevent patients from being sued by private and voluntary hospitals, which are all 501c3 charities. They're charging people 9% interest. They've sued 40,000 people in the last couple of years. People are being sued for as much as $1,500 while the hospitals are receiving billions in state indigent care funds and federal CARES Act funds. They're suing people right now in the middle of the pandemic. We need to reform how hospitals are um, approaching medical debt, how hospitals bill people. It's overwhelming. The system is not working for patients. The other thing that I think we really have to do is, as Bill said, is reform the indigent care pool. It's being spent foolishly. We need to target it to true safety net hospitals. We need to shore them up. We also need to have real health 
planning that really thinks about communities of colors and health equity and doesn't just rubber stamp the, the, the continued merger and acquisition and consolidation in the healthcare industry that is costing us a lot. And most importantly, we need to figure out a way to cover immigrants. We have to have all, every member have access of society, of New York society, to have um, access to health insurance. California has gone forward for young people. Illinois has gone forward for immigrant coverage for older people. We should do it for everybody, and we should be the first state to do it for everybody, you know, all, old, young, and alike. So that's that's what. And I challenge. We have a bunch of progressive new members. Let's get to work and do some progressive stuff. You know, it's it's exciting to start, even though it's such a horrible time. And everybody should stay safe and wear a mask. Get their shot whenever they can. Awesome. All right, Kim, your turn. Oh, you're muted. The, the class that is joining the legislature this year is probably one of the largest ever. It's also one of the brightest and best experienced ever. But they're going to face a healthcare system that sometimes is so complex it'll drive you crazy. My recommendation is just work on helping your constituents and learn the system that way. First of all, your constituents are going to need help more than ever before. How are they going to get coverage? How are they going to get that coverage applied? How are the hospitals? How are, the, how are all of the clinics that we didn't mention, the, the, the federally qualified healthcare clinics, one of the essential arms of healthcare in this entire state? Um, are there, are there uh, systems that can help uh, people with special needs, hospice, uh, self-directed healthcare, um, uh, brain injured? These are a number of different programs that exist. Learning about them helps the constituents. And then by learning that, you can take the lessons and start to apply them so that when the system needs changes, you can really weigh in in an important way. And then I think it's one of the most exciting jobs to have. Congratulations on getting it. All right, and Commissioner, your parting words. Um, my parting words are very, uh, are very simple. One is if we're gonna be moving into local community care, really get to know the distinctions between long-term care, manage long-term care in your communities, but also across the state. And I think that that is essential for any new uh, incoming legislative, know those distinctions. The other thing is fight for broadband accessibility for all. There's so many new innovations that we have learned, whether it was virtual programming, whether it's telemedicine, and people keep thinking that New York City is rich in broadband. Well, it is not. So accessibility to services, especially to essential health services, is not going to be there unless we have broadband addressed throughout the state. And the other thing I would say to you, and I think um, Senator Hammond said it so, so, so clearly, this is a very complex system. We need many, many navigators to help people navigate, particularly Medicaid and Medicare, as you are, this population is exploding, the aging population is gonna grow and many people have not been part of these systems in the past. And so when you start getting introduced to public systems that have a lot of complex requirements and application processes, the only way, particularly if you wanna stay in your community is to really know how to navigate that process for managed long-term care. It is very complex. So we need in every one of these localities that you are now representing to make sure that we have enough navigators who can help family members, caregivers, as well as the older person themselves uh, navigate. And the other thing that, and my final word is support funding for things like either long-term community care, as well as NORC, naturally reoccurring services in the community so that people can stay at home. That is the way of the future that prevents institutionalization that keeps families together. That is a very low cost way of providing long-term care. So I ask all of you to get very familiar with those kind of processes because that is what you will be able to shift and change the way we do services in the state. All right, well, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Bill, Elizabeth, and Kemp also. I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Zach, but again, just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Thanks so much, Shannon. Uh, 
some of the best minds in uh, state healthcare policy right there. Um, and this will be our final panel of the day. I think you can see right here in my living room, uh, it's getting dark. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you for all of our moderators and all of you that have been watching everything. Let's keep the conversation going at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, December 16th, where we're having our responsible 100 celebratory webinar. Registration is free and you can find all the details in the chat. And of course, one last shout out to our great sponsors, Ostroff Associates, Brown and Weinrob, and Long Point Advisors. Until next time, I'm Zach Williams, staff writer at City and State. Take it easy. Thank you. Bye.